All right, welcome. We're back to reading the rulings from the ATF that were announced on April 11th. Uh, this is a live stream, uh, the third one now. We're starting at page 100, and, or we're taking off from page 151 after two previous sessions. Uh, the first session uh, lasted about an hour and a half, I think, uh, and I spent, oops, I spent that time uh, digging into about the first 40-something pages, just reading it, not quite verbatim. I was removing some of the footnotes and, and clauses and little references to the different codes and things to make it reasonable to understand for a human being instead of uh, an alternative to a robot reader that would read every character. Uh, to be honest, I had no idea it would take this long to get into it. Uh, I kind of figured it might take a couple of hours to read the entire thing. I had no idea how many uh, images or illustrations there might be that took up room. It is double spaced, but it is a lot of, or it is mostly words. So the first 45 something pages were just kind of digging in and summary and explaining kind of the overall, I guess, to some extent. Then it got into for the next session, the second session, which was three hours plus, uh, digging into the next hundred pages of this thing. Uh, it gets into the the, the um, what would you say, like the the responses to the comments and the review of the comments that came in during the comment period for this whole uh, new ruling. So. I don't know where we're at here. So this is the third day. I'm looking at another five plus hours potentially of reading. And I don't know if that's the best use of time or resource. So there is some, it's not just reading garbage. There's some interesting things in here. Uh, I've been attempting to make some notes without disrupting the, re the narration or the reading or whatever. And I have been getting some feedback that it's useful for those who just want to know the information in it. Again, I started this just as a way to offer a, a more concise or more useful version of a red, from an audio version of this thing. I don't think there's one out there. Uh, and we're able to do this because Patreons uh, are out there supporting our projects and I'm using, you know, I'm assuming that they'd be interested in, in using the time this way, but it's definitely becoming less and less apparent that that's an, this is an effective use of time. So if you're listening to this live, feel free to leave some opinion on this. But if you're listening to this in the future, you're I'm definitely interested if these types of things are useful or effective uh, uses of time. That being said, I did do a little bit different today. I expect I went through and skimmed the document. I'll put a link to the document here. It's in the description of the video, wherever you happen to find this. I don't know if I'll be posting these around or not. I probably will. Um, this time, uh, I'm looking at the PDF document provided by the ATF. It's on their website. Scroll down past the 150 point to see, you know, does it turn into any illustrations or is it? You know, the last few pages of it, are they useless? Well, it's more than the last few pages that just offer the changes to existing law, the updates and the edits. And I don't really feel like reading all that. That's a lot of just reading existing law and, you know, where they change something to be plural or it's a lot of extra reading that I don't think needs to be done. So I guess I'll attempt to um, uh, just start with one page 150 and and give it another session today and then go from the feedback today if it's worth, if we don't finish, to see if it's worth finishing this thing. Uh, we're not lawyers. Nobody's going to be too much use of this. It is insightful. It's difficult to read. There's definitely useful data here. However, uh, you know, it's not just gold nuggets. And again, give me some feedback. With that, I've got some coffee here and uh, we'll dig in. So I'm looking at it on the screen here. 
and uh, page 150. I don't know why I'm saying page 150, but anyway, I'm assuming my audio is good. I'll just dig in. <clears throat> Uh, everybody who's watching live, this isn't for you, but people that are listening in the future, this isn't, I got other things I should be doing with this amount of time this week. I don't, I'm not independently wealthy. So if you're uh, interested in buying a cup of coffee or um, supporting our projects in any way, uh, we are on the Patreon platform. Uh, we've got that Kofi thing, coffee thing, go to gunwebsites.com. You'll see some links over there. Uh, check out the, um, uh, store our gear website store if you want to buy something we've got some print on demand stuff so there's no obligation but if you do feel like uh, supporting uh, the time spent here there's plenty of ways you can do it and uh, again no obligation to the people that are already on board with supporting us that's what we're here for all right that said um skip legal stuff for sure you mean the yeah i'm not like in this case where it says under section 921 a 3a i don't say that because it's just weird and hard to say plus nobody's robot to understand any of that anyway so yeah i'll just skip over and say under some part of the law or whatever however i can reference it quickly and then keep going or just ignore it because a lot of times it's just there for legal reasons all right that being said we're going to dig in and uh again thanks to our patrons for making it possible for me to uh take the time to even consider doing this all right the rule relies all right, where are we even at? We're somewhere in the department response to one of the posits, one of the comments that was against. So we're in a portion of the document that's explaining the pers they've explained that the procedure for new rulemaking includes a comment period. And in that comment period, which took place this time last year, they got a, a number, hundreds of thousands of comments about this potential rule change and in this portion of this document they're explaining the comments that came in against the rules and in this case there was a specific i mean there's probably does a dozen topics against their rules that they're going to address and this is one of them and this is their reaction to the concern so in other words their explanation of why the concern has no validity, I guess. So the comment was the ATF does not have the authority to include parts kits in the definition of firearms. And then there's some explanation for that, that that's what we ended with yesterday. Their response was the department disagrees with the commenters, which is obviously what they're doing. forward regular internet i've been thinking about actually getting a different internet that should be cheaper but i'm not 100 percent convinced it's better wireless instead of a cable but my cable is not that good so uh i just noticed it because my screen just dropped out i'm getting this little connection unstable signal over here so apologize for it, uh, connection issues all right so um they'll disagree with the comment which we can expect then they offer insight as to why they disagree, and that's why it's difficult to not comment or make commentary on these comments because we get a lot of insight, and that's why I'm still reading this, is because we get a lot of insight here as to uh, the ATF's perspective and our role and their role. And... Uh, well, again, I've got some notes over here. I'll attempt to make some notes so that we can uh, address some of these things and get as much out of this as possible for this amount of effort to read this whole thing. All right, so anybody that wants to skip ahead, I'll just put a timestamp in the comments so let you get right into where we start reading again. But I'm trying to get my bearings on. We're getting uh, we're in the portion where they're talking about comments and they're addressing the comments that are against their rules, and they just said how. They think they do have the right to put parts kits in as guns because, and we'll swing back into it, the rule also relies on existing case law to provide a definition of the term readily and to detail the factors relevant to making that determination when classifying firearms. 
As earlier explained, in recent years, manufacturers and retailers have been selling to individuals weapons parts kits with incomplete frames or receivers, commonly called 80% receivers, without conducting background checks or maintaining records. Some of these parts kits contain all of the necessary components along with jigs, templates, or other tools that allow an individual to complete a functional weapon with minimal effort, expertise, or equipment within a short period of time. The department disagrees with commenters who said that regulating weapons parts kits were missing certain parts such as firing pins would be futile. A weapons missing a firing pin is still a fire. Oh no, I was way past this. I remember reading all this. I'm not reading that page again. All right, so basically they're saying, oh, we don't care. If it has any missing parts, we're still gonna call it a firearm. However, it would be impossible for the department to set forth the regulations in a precise minimum, per I think I read all this too. So that's probably where I was at. So next one would be definition of frame or receiver. The comment in disagreement with the ruling said, despite the grandfathered provision, ATF provided in the comment period for existing frames or receivers, commenters said there is still confusion because one cannot examine the definition of frame or receiver to determine with any certainty whether a specific part of a firearm that was previously classified as a single frame or receiver is redefined as a split or modular frame or receiver and whether the entire scope of the definition is dependent on the director. Other commenters asserted that the definition of frame or receiver is vague because almost any housing or structure that is at all visible from the exterior is susceptible to a classif classification as a frame or receiver or would make every single part of firearm or every single part of a firearm a fire control component such that firearms like the AR-15 may now include as many as 10 frames or receivers. Another commenter stated that the open-ended nature of fire control components makes it difficult, if not impossible, to determine what constitutes the frame or receiver. The commenter explained that some magazine catches could be a frame or receiver because these components are visible from the exterior of a completed firearm and provide a structure to hold or integrate a component necessary for the fire or the firearm to initiate or continue the firing sequence. For example, a magazine for use in a semi-automatic pistol equipped with a magazine disconnect. The commenter stated that the ATF's illustrations purport to indicate that only one part is the frame or receiver when in fact the deception show Depictions, depictions show that the firearms with more than one component that meet the definition using only the listed fire control components. For example, the commenter stated, the hinged revolver example indicates that the frame is the rear half of the firearm, even though the front half of the firearm obviously provides a housing or structure to hold or integrate the cylinder when the, fire is, the firearm is assembled. Commenters also pointed out that the ATF did not explain what it means by other reliable evidence, where it stated any such part identified with a serial number shall be presumed absent of an official determination by the director or other re reliable evidence to the contrary to be a frame or receiver. Given that firearms classifications are not released to the public, the commenters questioned on how anyone is to know whether a given firearm has or has not received an official determination. There's a lot there. So this is their the ATF's response to all that. The department believes that the grandfather provision in the proposed rule would have eliminated most of the concerns raised by the commenters concerning the proposed definition of frame or receiver and agrees that it relied heavily on the ATF classifications of specific components as a frame or receiver. Nonetheless, as stated previously, the department agrees with commenters that the definition of frame or excuse me, definition of firearm in the code is best read to mean a single part of a weapon or device as being the frame or receiver. Accordingly, the final rule adopts certain subsets of the proposed definition firearm frame or receiver while providing new distinct definitions of frame or receiver. Whereas the proposed rule would have considered any housing or structure for any fire control component of frame or receiver, the final rule focuses on these definitions by describing a specific housing or structure for one specific type of fire control component. This will help licensees and the public determine on their own which portion of the firearm is the frame or receiver without an ATF classification. The final rule the department has established 
in, in the final rule, the department has established new definitions for the term frame to apply to handguns, receiver to apply or frame to apply to handguns, receiver to apply to rifles, shotguns and projectile weapons other than handguns, and frame or receiver to rep to apply to supply silencers. Again, I'm never going to say mufflers and silencers because I hate that. So I'm just going to say silencers. Half the time when I say silencers, it also says mufflers and silencers. Most specifically with respect to handguns, the department is adopting in this final rule a definition of frame that incorporates language similar to that proposed by commenter Sig Sawyer described below. The term frame will be described as the part of the handgun or various variants thereof that provides housing or a structure for the primary energized component. All right, we're gonna start putting in a primary energized component into the notes over here because that's messed up already where'd that even come from i should have made some commercial breaks i'm gonna need coffee today uh the provides housing for a structure for the primary energized component designed to hold the hammer back the striker, bolt, or similar component prior to the initiation of the firing sequence, even if pins or other attachments are required to connect such component to the housing or structure. This definition is consistent with the common understanding of the term frame as the basic unit of a handgun that holds the operating parts of the weapon. These operating parts necessarily include the sear or equivalent component that is energized prior to initiation of the firing sequence. However, the department does not adopt the same definition with respect to rifle, shotgun, and projectile weapons other than handguns, which are commonly understood to incorporate a receiver. This term is generally understood to be the part in which the action of the firearm is fitted and to which the breech end of the barrel is attached. Because the action of the firearm is commonly understood to mean the physical mechanism that manipulates cartridges and or seals the breech, the term receiver is designed defined in the final rule as the part of the rifle, shotgun, or projectile weapon other than a handgun or variants thereof that provides housing or structure for the primary component designed to block or seal the breach prior to initiation of the firing sequence, even if pins or other attachments are required to connect such component to the housing structure. For purposes of these definitions, the term variant and variants thereof are defined as a weapon utilizing a similar frame or receiver design irrespective of new or different model designations or configurations, characteristics, features, components, accessories, or attachments. For example, an AK type firearm with a short stock and a pistol grip is a pistol variant of an AK type rifle. An AR-type firearm with a short stock and pistol grip is a pistol variant of an AR-type rifle. And a revolving cylinder shotgun is a shotgun variant of a revolver. <laughs> okay, they said that. I didn't, I'm just quoting what they said. The definition of frame or receiver with respect to a firearm muffler is described in section whatever of this preamble. The final rule does not adopt the proposed supplement entitled split or modular frame or receiver. Additionally, in response to comments, the department has added a new grandfather supplement expressly defining the term frame or receiver to include prior, FAT, prior ATF classifications of a specific component as the frame or receiver and clarified how multi-piece frames or receivers with modular subparts are defined and must be marked. These amendments should be should greatly diminish commenters' concerns regarding any lack of specificity or confusion regarding the particular models listed in the proposed definitions. The final rule includes a wide variety of examples and pictures to illustrate the frame or receiver of popular models and variants thereof. You're going to love those pictures. Um, as well as particular models previously classified by the ATF that are grandfathered, such as the lower receiver of an AR-15 variant firearms, which house the trigger mechanism and hammer rather than the breech block or sealing component, the bolt. All right, next is another one about, or some comments that came in about alternate definitions of the frame or receiver. 
commenters opposed to the proposed rule have either urged the ATF to withdraw the rulemaking or come up with a more concise, less complex definition. While some commenters agreed that ATF's current definition of frame or receiver is outdated, antiquated, or confusing, several commenters from the industry said a new definition should be tailored to focus on new designs and should be done with meaningful input from stakeholders. A few commenters stated that there were numerous other ways for ATF to amend its definition to adapt technological advances while also being consistent with the wider public's understanding, excuse me, interpretation, longstanding interpretation of the term to mean a single component of a given firearm. Commenter Sig Sawyer, for example, suggested the following possible alternative definitions. Makes it really hard to not like Sig Sawyer if they're in there pushing around the ATF in their own comment periods and they're being mentioned in the comment periods by the ATF, but I'm not commenting. Uh, suggested the following possible alternative definitions. Uh, firearm frame or receiver means the component of the firearm which provides a housing for the component responsible for constraining the energized component of the firearm. Example, the sear or equivalent. Firearm frame or receiver means the component of the firearm which provides a housing for the component which the operator interacts with to initiate the firing sequence of the firearm, the trigger mechanism or the equivalent. Or the third part is the firearm frame or receiver means the component of the firearm which incorporates or provides a housing for the component which interacts with the barrel to form the chamber of the firearm. One commenter stated that the ATF's goal to update the definition of frame or receiver to accommodate split frame receivers would be met simply by rewriting the existing definition to read the part of a firearm that provides housing for the hammer, bolt, or breech block firing mechanism or at its forward position receives the barrel. Another commenter similarly suggested that ATF use or rather than and or rather than and as the conjoiner in the current definition of firearm frame or receiver, such that the list of the components housed by the frame or receiver would read the hammer, bolt, breech block, or firing mechanism. Another commenter suggested that ATF adopt the definition of receiver that is in the Sporting Arms and Ammunition Manufacturers Institute, SAMI, um, glossary of industry terms available on that organization's website. So in other words, the industry definition. Another commenter suggested a point system that would assign points to the fire control group would be three points, the hammer would be one point, and the striker would be one point. Under this suggestion, the internal ex external part that has the most points would be the frame or receiver. I'm trying not to comment so hard. Um, while some commenters suggested ATF just accept the manufacturer's designated component identified as a firearm for each model, another commenter, Sammy, the whatever it is, uh, Sporting Arms and Ammunition Manufacturers Institute, suggested with respect to the AR-15, ATF could simply amend the existing regulation to specify the lower receiver as the frame or receiver of that firearm. Another comment commenter suggested that frame or receiver should be defined as that portion of the weapon that holds the fire control group consisting of any of the following, trigger, sear, safety, and hammer, if the weapon is hammer fired. According to the commenter, this would consistently mean that the lower receiver and encompasses all weapons, the lower on the AR-15, the lower on the Glock, the lower on the break open shotgun, the lower on a revolver, and the lower on a semi-automatic pistol would be the fire firearm, regardless of the striker fire or hammer fire, because it holds the trigger or sear. This, according to the commenter, would also encompass the side plate on certain machine guns. To address the cases which ATF has not prevailed in litigation, hmm, one commenter suggested a more specific fix that would define frame or receiver as the mounting point, housing structure, or the significant part thereof for a firearm's barrel, barrels, or barrel assembly, since all guns have at least one barrel. Or, oh really, or to address that striker-fired mechanisms are not fully captured under current law. Commenter said the definition could easily be amended to that part of a firearm which provides housing for the fire or for the hammer, the striker, bolt or breech lock, and firing mechanism, which is usually threaded and forward portion to receive the barrel. So, see what I'm saying? That's like a page. I'm not trying to comment here, but that's like a page of them talking about all these different things that came in. 
like if I was writing a report for school, they'd ding me for wasting time there and diverting from the topic, but I'm not commenting. Here's the response to all of that. The department agrees with the commenters who stated that the ATF's current definition of frame receiver is outdated and confusing and the proposed definition should be simplified. For this reason, ATF is providing a new regulatory definition of frame or receiver to encompass existing and new firearms designs. The Gun Control Act and the NFA do not define the term frame or receiver, so only the regulatory definitions of that term in our code are being redefined. For the reasons previously discussed, the department agrees that a more concise, less complex definition that focuses on a single part of each weapon is preferable and will adopt the definition of frame with respect to handguns and receiver with respect to rifle, shotguns, and projectile weapons other than handguns. The department disagrees with the commenters who suggested amending the current definitions of frame or receiver by replacing and with or as the conjoiner with respect to the listed components of the current definition. Under this alternative, any part of a firearm that houses either the hammer or the bolt or breech lock of a, or a firing mechanism or that receives the barrels would be considered frames or receivers. Thus, under this alternative, there could exist even more firearms parts that, parts that would constitute a frame or receiver than identified by the proposed rule. This alternative does not identify a single receiver in numerous split receiver firearms in an AR-15 type rifle, for example, the hammer, firing mechanism, and forward position that receives the barrel are all in the lower receiver, but the bolt or breech lock is in the upper receiver. What? They think that a barrel is attached to the lower receiver? Uh, did I read that wrong? In an AR-15 type rifle, for example, the hammer, firing mechanism, and forward portion that receives the barrel are all in the lower receiver, but the bolt or breech lock is in the upper. Man, are we allowed to be like, ha, doesn't, it's all invalidates the whole thing. Gotcha, suckers. Anyway, I'm not commenting. The same problem exists when applying Sammy's definition from the glossary of industry terms. Because the firing breech mechanisms are not in the same receiver. While the lower receiver houses the firing mechanism and is attached to the stock, the upper receiver houses the breech block and is attached to the barrel. Therefore, under Sammy's published definition in an AR-15 type firearm, for example, there would still be more than one part that would be defined as a firearm or receiver on this weapon, as well as on numerous split or modular models of firearms in common use today. This alternative definition does not explain how it would apply to firearms that do not have a hammer, but are fired using a striker, which may be located in different housings depending on the type of firearm. The department also disagrees with the point system recommended by one commenter because it does not explain how the point values were reached and why fire control components and other portions of the assembled weapons were not assigned any points. It would not address firearms and that do, house, that do not house all fire control group components within a single housing or which have remote trigger outs what a remote trigger outside the weapon. Is that a thing? Where do we have remote triggers outside the weapon? Uh, I need to find out about that upgrade. In sum, this alternative would fall short of addressing all technologies or designs of firearms that are currently available or may, may become available in the future. It does not address potential changes in firearms terminology. The department agrees with Sammy on expressing in the final rule that the lower receiver of an AR-15 or other variants thereof is the receiver of that weapon. The final rule also includes a diagram of the AR-15 receiver. The department will also grandfather in all prior ATF classifications specifying which single component of a weapon is a frame or receiver. However, the department will not grandfather ATF determination, determinations that a partially complete, disassembled, or non-functional frame or receiver, including a parts kit, was not or did not include a firearm frame or receiver as defined prior to the rule including those where ATF determined that the item or kit had not yet reached a stage of manufacture to become one. My head hurts. In any event, simply specifying that the lower receiver of the AR-15 Colt Sporter is a receiver does not resolve the problem of defining the term frame or receiver. With respect to all the firearms with a split or multi-piece frame or receiver, all those that are striker or those that are striker fired, the problem remains that a court could decide that the current definition of frame or receiver does not apply to those firearms. Thus, existing definition is not adequate with respect to the vast majority of firearms currently in the United States. 
why is removing all of these things not an option? They insist on making it more confusing. So I'll quit commenting. The department declines to accept the proposed alternative definition saying that a frame receiver is a portion of the weapon that holds the fire control group consisting any of the following trigger sear safety hammer if the weapon is hammer fired. First, if first some firearms may be initiated, initiated manually by hand or slam fired without a part that actually holds the trigger, sear safety and hammer, and all complete assembled weapons must have a frame or receiver. What? Second, not all of the fire control components may be in the same portion of the weapon and some fire control groups or portions thereof may be found outside the frame or receiver or triggered remotely. <laughs> what are they talking about? Nonetheless, the final rule accepts this alternative insofar as the frame of a handgun will be defined as the part that provides housing for the primary energized component designed to hold back the hammer or striker, which is generally the sear. The department also declines to accept the proposed alternative definition saying that the frame or receiver is the mounting point, housing structure, or the significant part thereof for a firearm's barrel, barrel, or barrel assemblies, since all guns have at least one barrel. This suggested definition will be inconsistent with what the ATF and the firearms industry have understood to be the frame or receiver of numerous semi-automatic handguns, such as the Glock, the SIG, pistols, and variants thereof, which is the lower portion of the weapons housing, the SEER, trigger mechanism and other fire control parts. In such handguns, the barrel is housed in the upper slide. The suggested definition would therefore create confusion for many firearms manufacturers. Remove the definitions then. The new definitions in this rule are intended to describe the specific part of weapons that has traditionally been considered the frame or receiver for almost all firearms, but are general enough to accommodate future designs and changes in parts terminology. The few exceptions, such as the AR-15 rifle and the Ruger Mark, whatever, four pistol, are, what? Mark four. That was a Mark three, all right, whatever. So pistol are grandfathered into the definitions of these terms and may continue to be marked in the same manners they have been prior to the effective date of this rule. The department acknowledges comments that stated the current definition does not include housing for striker fired weapons the new definitions with focus on housing for structure for a single fire control component uh, the sear or equivalent for handguns and bolt for breech lock or equivalent for all other projectile weapons are broad enough to cover both striker and hammer fired weapons all right time for a pause Yeah, this is super hard to read because of that. All right, next section, definition of firearm muffler or silencer frame or receiver. This is another example of being weird in order to make everybody uncomfortable and hate you. This is an example of it. What could we have put in here all the time to make people hate us and be super weird about it, but still be technically legal? That right there. All right, I had to take a break from saying all that stuff. So next up is definition of firearms muffler or silencer frame or receiver. The comments received, some commenters oppose the proposed definition of complete muffler or silencer device, stating that the new definition would subject persons who possess a complete but disassembled silencer to the civil and criminal penalties associated with the possession of a complete silencer. They also objected to frames or receivers of silencer devices which may not be in an operatable, operational state, become subject to the new law, the new readily factors test to establish the scope of weapons, parts, kits, and fire, firearm frame or receiver regulation. One manufacturer also pointed out that the definition of complete silencer device does not appear to include a silencer that uses a firearm mounted flash hider or other attachment devices for use if the mounting device is not included with or attached to the silencer. Separately, while some commenters noted that the proposed definition of firearms muffler or silencer frame or receiver is an improvement on current law, there remains confusion regarding whether ATF intends for only a singular part to be the frame or receiver for firearm silencers. They stated that ATF should clarify in the final rule 
that firearm silencers only need to be marked on a single piece that is the frame or receiver. Another manufacturer raised a similar concern that under the proposed definition, non-welded suppressors end cap appears to be a frame or receiver requiring serialization. The manufacturer gave an example of the Ruger something or another silent blah, blah, blah silencers that use a traditional baffle stack on a non-welded individual baffle housed in a serialized tube when installed, the end cap secures the baffles in place within the tube. The end cap in this instance seems to be a frame or receiver because it provides housing or structure designed to hold or integrate one or more essential internal components of the device. They stated that this conclusion, if accurate, would mean that a majority of suppressors utilizing a non-welded design have more than one frame or receiver, contract, contrary to ATF's position. The same manufacturer also raised concerns about ATF's attempt to memorial memorialize the long-standing policy of regarding silencer parts transferred between qualified individuals. The proposed rule allowed such transfers on the condition that upon receipt, the parts are actively used to manufacture a complete muffler or silencer device. The manufacturer argued that this section does not seem to allow a qualified manufacturer to send unmarked suppressor components to another qualified manufacturer for further manufacturing activities, examples of coding or further machining. If the parts are not going to be assembled into a complete muffler or silencer by the subcontractor of the manufacturer, because actively is not defined, the commenting manufacturer stated it was unclear if, could, if it could transfer a large quantity of suppressor parts to a subcontractor to be consumed as needed by the manufacturer to make complete supp suppressors over an extended period. A state in the department ATF's response to that, as stated previously, the department agrees with commenters that the term frame or receiver is best read to mean a singular frame or receiver that must be identified with a single unique serial number. This would include the frame or receiver of a complete firearm silencer. The department also agrees with the comment that the end cap on an outer tube of a modular piece would have been considered a structural component within the meaning of a frame or receiver as proposed. End caps are often damaged or destroyed upon expulsion of projectiles, leaving the, the suppressor without any traceable markings of identification. For this reason, the department is amending the definition of these terms in the final rule as follows. In the case of a firearm suppressor, the part of the firearm, such as the outer tube or modular piece that provides a housing or structure for the primary internal component designed to reduce the sound of a projectile in the case of a modular firearms muffler or firearm silencer device with more than one such part, the term shall mean the principal housing attached to the weapon that expels a projectile, even if the adapter on the other attachments are required to connect the part to the weapon. Of course, obviously. The term shall not include the removable end cap of an outer tube or module, modular piece. Obviously, they don't need to put that in there because we all knew that part. Assholes. They could just get rid of these things and consider them muzzle devices and then... Think about how much money the country would save. We, oh, we wouldn't. I'm not commenting. The department also agrees with the commenter who stated that the proposed provision concerning transfers of firearms, mufflers, or silencers between qualified licensees could be read to include exclude further manufacturing activities such as further machining or applying protective coatings. For this reason, the department has removed the term actively and instead explained that mufflers or silencers must be marked by close in the next business day after the entire manufacturing process has been completed. <laughs> oh, that's nice of them. The department has also made minor amendments to the marketing make, mark, marking allowances to make clear that mufflers may be transferred between qualified manufacturers for further manufacturer without immediately identifying and registering them. Once the new device with such part is completed, the manufacturer of the device must identify and register it in the manner within the period specified in the part for the complete silencer. Next is the comments about the definition of split or modular frame. With respect to the ATF classifying the frame or receiver of a split or modular frame, a receiver, numerous commenters objected to the definition, not only in the grounds that it was too broad and confusing, but that to obtain certainty, it was largely dependent on ATF making classifications. They critiqued this process as lacking transparency, objectives, objectivity, and efficiency, as well as placing too much power in the hands of the ATF. 
Numerous commenters said they introduce new models multiple times per year and assuming a new determination is needed for each new model or configuration, they have serious concerns that the classification process would bury them in red tape. They stated the lead time, which is currently six to 12 months or more, would be much longer if hundreds of manufacturers were submitting to determine which components qualifies as the receiver, and this would be costly and disruptive to their companies. Due to the current delays in obtaining classifications, one customer su commenter suggested the proposal could discourage classification requests rather than encourage them. Several industry members stated the firearm-specific definitions under splitter modular frame or receiver are confusing. It is not clear if the definitions apply only to the firearms produced by those manufacturers listed or if it applies to all firearms that follow the same basic design. The confusion, they stated, is evident in the first of these definitions for whatever blah, blah, blah list of guns. They questioned if the definition applies only to hammer-fired semi-automatic pistols if manufactured by these discrete manufacturers or if it applies to all firearms that integrate an operating system that matches the ATF's provided definitions for these firearms. Similarly, they stated the ATF's use of type was unclear and asked, for instance, if Sig Sawyer 320 type semi-automatic pistols is meant to include only 320s or exact replicas thereof, or if it's meant to convey a broader meaning of any firearm that has the basic design, even if it uses different materials or has different gross dimensions, such as the P6365. Additionally, commenters stated that the non-exclusive list used in the definitions Four frame or receivers indicate that there are other frames, designs, and configurations not listed that fall into a category of type, but that are un unknown to the public. Commenters also questioned what ATF meant by comparable when the comment period explained that split or modular frame designs are not comparable to an existing classification, would not be grandfathered in under the rule, thus making it impossible for more than one part of a firearm to be a receiver under the proposed definitions. Numerous commenters noted that several models of firearms were missing from the list of examples under the supplemental definition of frame or receiver entitled splitter modular frame or receiver, and that without clearer, more articulate lists, it appears that several models would be subject to more marking requirements. One commenter, an FFL SOT, expressed that examples provided in the definitions do not include the most widespread and popular 22 long rifle, rifle pistols, such as the Ruger Mark 1234, Browning, Buckmark, Smith & Wesson 41, and similar designs. They stated that millions of these have been sold over the past 70 years with the serialized firearm component varying between models from the assembly containing the barrel to the assembly containing the trigger mechanism. Without addressing these models, the comments said it was not clear whether ser where serialization should occur. Similarly, another commenter provided examples of three models, something, 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 and it listed several parts of each firearm and the commenter believes it would be subject to the marking requirements under the proposed definitions. The PS90 firearm was another model raised to which the commenter did not understand how the new definition would apply. The commenter stated that the upper of the FN PS90 is the serialized component and the stock assembly made entirely out of plastic as a stock. Under the comment period's definition, the comment commenter said that the stock would need to be serialized because it is made of two externally visible parts bolted together. Therefore, the commenter questioned whether each half of the stock would require its own serial number or if the parts would need to have an injection molding done by a type of licensee. Other commenters opined that the example AK. 47 type firearms not consistent with many AK firearms already lawfully possessed. Wait, another commenter opined that the example for AKs was not consistent with most AKs. The commenter stated that while many of these firearms marked on the identified single receiver, many of these types of firearms have been imported with a serial number only marked on the front trunnion. Thus, the commenter asked that this is an example would be reevaluated since it's unlikely ATF is intending to identify an unmarked part of thousands of firearms. <clears throat> Other commenters similarly said the ATF made an error when it listed the frame or receiver for the Breda AR-70 as the lower receiver because under existing precedent, the upper receiver of the AR-70 has been treated as the frame. Finding the non-exclusive list of frame or receiver examples to be inadequate and likely to lead to confusion or resulting in thousands of unnamed firearms types that will, by default, have multiple frames or receivers, other commenters said ATF should make all known existing classifications public or listed in a final rule. It is, they argued, the only way to ensure fairness. Here's the ATF's response to all that. But I'm going to go get something to drink and an aspirin. So we take a break while we get ready for the answer.
So in this episode, the ATF was called out for posting the wrong picture of an AK for not knowing crap about the PS90 and being a dingus. And here's their response. The department agrees with numerous commenters that the supplement to the definition entitled splitter modular frame or receiver would have been difficult for persons to apply under the proposed definition of frame or receiver. That meant a housing for any fire control component. Additionally, the department acknowledges commenters' concerns that many models of firearms were not included and that the proposed definition could lean persons to submit a new classification request rather than relying on the definition to identify the flame or receiver. The department, in response to these comments, is finalizing a definition of frame or receiver in a new code that incorporates limited subsets of the proposed definition while providing distinct definitions for frame and receiver. The new definitions under frame or receiver focus only on one housing or structural component for a given we type of weapon. Because the final rule focuses on a single component based on the recommendations of commenters, there is no longer a need for the supplement entitled split or modular flame or receiver and it is not adopted in the final rule. The department also acknowledges that the lower portion of the AR-70 was mistakenly identified as the receiver of that firearm in the comment period. Under the final rule, the upper portion of the AR-70 remains the receiver of that firearm described by the new definition of receiver. Furthermore, to ensure the industry members and others can rely on ATF's prior classifications, most prior ATF classifications and variants thereof have been grandfathered into the new definition of frame or receiver, along with examples and diagrams of some of these weapons, such as bunch of guns. The only exceptions are classifications of partially complete disassembled or non-functional frames or receivers that ATF has determined did not fall within the definition of frame or receiver prior to this rule. Such classifications, including parts kits, would need to be resubmitted for evaluation if persons remain unclear which specific portion of a weapon or device falls within the definition of frame or receiver, they may voluntarily submit a request to the ATF as provided in this rule. So, Next one is alternative for defense industry under splitter modular frame receiver. Another commenter who represents members of the defense manufacturing industry suggested, including as an example, box type as a split frame or receiver for which a single part had been previously classified by the director, externally powered weapons. The commenter explained as follows, some externally powered designs include a part called the front housing that directly attaches to the existing frame or receives or receiver and houses the breech. The front housing positions the breech to align with the bolt, which in turn allows the bolt assembly to properly lock and drop the firing pin, which the bolt is inst installed. Whew. Under the proposed definition, the commenter observed this appears, it appears that this front housing could include this and other parts of the weapon not previously understood to be the frame or receiver. In addition, the existing bathtub or box type receiver as an alternative, the com commenter suggested adding language that would exempt externally powered weapons that require a separate electronic gun control unit to fire, which are solely in a government military platform, you know, shit, uh, simulation or training ex exercises. Oh, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. I forgot to I mentioned I didn't have I, I forgot to send those magnet things in the last shipment. So I'll be sending those out separate. Um, uh, but thanks for that. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see. So they're talking about things that we can't even own assholes as a completely different alternative. The same count commenter requested that the ATF include a simple annual notification procedure where qualified defense importer and manufacturer license could prove that they met opt-out requirements. I want this opt-out requirement. I'm going to put that in my comments. Can we opt out? Who wants to opt out? Just type in hashtag opt out if you want to opt out all this crap. And the proposed rule would proceed with their processes under the existing regulatory requirements. The commenter suggested an app out provision because an increased compliance obligations of the proposed rule would further complicate an already challenging workflow and impede contractual, de contractual deadlines the commenter's clients have with U.S. government. <laughs> Why do you think they put this in here? I'm going to go ahead and comment. You think they put this in here because there's seriously military industrial complex issues with this law or because they want us to be mad? Did they put this in here because they seriously think military contractors are paying attention to this? Or do they put this in here for us to be mad? 
Don't get mad about this shit. Get mad that they put this shit in front of us. Don't get mad about the words in this shit. Get mad at who's feeding you the shit. This is obvious. This obvious ploy is effing obvious. So this, don't get mad at this. Get mad at the fact that they're giving us this shit. They don't give us a choice. Anyway, the department declines to adopt the commenter's suggestion to add ATF's class. I'm going to miss the part that's obvious distraction. It's designed to make us hate our own industry. So manufacturer's concern with publicly required. Okay, so let's go back to a real one here. Uh, definition of partially complete disassemble their inoperable frame. Commenters opposed to inclusion of partially complete frames or receivers in the proposed definition of frame or receiver stated that the proposed rule would be difficult, if not impossible, to enforce. They opine that there is no purpose in trying to ban an 80% receiver or regulate partially complete receivers because the rule is easily undercut by 3D printing technology and the availability of online tutorials, which will only become more available and affordable for the public over time. One commenter, for example, stated that even if all unfinished or 80% receivers were taken away, firearms could still be made available by other means, citing the something FGC9 as an example. Because the commenter believes the technology undercuts the rule, the commenter argued that the new definitions and marking requirements serve no purpose and should not be adopted. Commenters had several questions about the terms used in the definition of partially complete frame or receiver, such as what it it means for an item to cross the critical line as to where it reaches the stage of manufacture where it is clearly identifiable as an unfinished component of a weapon. Other commenters asserted that the definition lacks objectivity and there is no objective metrics to guide the factors that are listed. With the proposed changes, the commenters questioned the meaning of the functional state. Similarly, the ATF stated in the preamble that the unformed blocks of metal or articles in a pre-mortal state without more would not be considered a partially complete frame or receiver. Commenters stated that it is still unclear what the, when these items fall under the definition where, for example, there were instruction booklets, metalworking tools, or tutorial videos because the definition, definition hinges on what without more means and that the ATF did not explain. Manufacturers also raised concerns because they purchased purchase partially machined raw materials or receiver shells without drilled fire control holes from domestic and foreign sources that are not current licensees. The manufacturers were concerned that the procedure would subsequently require their suppliers to obtain an FFL license, apply the markings, and keep A&D records, which would be very costly and disruptive. Another commenter suggested that the critical stage of manufacturer should be amended to say when the article becomes sufficiently complete to function as a frame or receiver. The department disagrees with commenters, and this is the stupid ATF, stupid response. The ATF disagrees with commenters who stated that inclusion of partially completed frames or receivers in the proposed definition of frame or receiver would be difficult, if not impossible, to enforce. The proposed and final rule, oh, thank you very much for that. That's how much money I made today, 60 bucks. Thanks. Appreciate both of you guys. Um, appreciate that. Let's see. Um, the department disagrees with commenters who stated that inclusion of partially complete frames or receivers in the proposed definition of frame or receiver would be difficult, if not possible, to enforce. The proposed and final rule both make clear that a partially complete frame or receiver must have reached a stage of manufacture where it is clearly identifiable as a component part of a weapon to be classified as a potential frame or receiver. Such articles have been regulated for importation and exportation since at least 1939. With regard to 3D printed, personally made firearms, this rule explains that as technology progresses, personally made firearms are likely to make their way to the licensed community because their firearms licensees are likely to market them for sale, accept them into pawn or repair them through gunsmithing services. <laughs> Oh, man. Additionally, the Gun Control Act requires out-of-state firearms transfers to go through licensees, and some states require firearm sales or transfers to be conducted through licensees, universal background checks. However, the department, agree dis department agrees with commenters that the supplement to the proposed definition of frame or receiver entirely partially complete to assembly or operable frame or receiver should be revised 
it's like the hundredth time I've read this, should be revised to provide more guidance on the application of the definition. In the final rule, the department has removed the definition of partially complete and modified the term frame or receiver and instead is expressed included from the definition of frame or receiver, forgings, castings, printings, extrusions, and unmined machined bodies, or similar articles that have not yet reached a state of manufacturer, unformed blocks of metal, liquid polymers, or other raw materials where they are clearly identifiable as an unfinished component of a weapon. Made, relayed, Related clarifying amendments, such as changing the term inoperable to the more accurate term non-functional and expressly stating that the section includes frame or receiver parts kits that are designed to be or may be readily be completed, assembled, restored, or otherwise converted to a functional state. And three, explain the meaning of the term functional state to be a frame or receiver that houses or provides a structure for the primary energized component of a handgun breach or block ceiling component of a projectile weapon or other handgun or internal sound reduction component of firearm muffler as fire case may be and four included detailed examples what would be considered a frame or receiver oh man let's keep reading all this so basically this section here is a big piece of boilerplate that they've said over and over this is their answer to everything so they're like here's an answer or here's a concern and here's our boilerplate answer and here's another reason why our same boilerplate answer it's really frustrating to read this stuff over and over and over again i imagine you're all hearing the same shit over and over and over again so i'm going to skip down the department degree disagrees with the comment that the supplement should be amended to say that the frame or receiver means one that has reached a stage of manufacturer when the article becomes sufficiently to complete to function as a frame or receiver the Gun Control Act does not explain when an article becomes sufficiently complete to become a frame or receiver. As stated previously, to determine when a frame or receiver is created, the rule is guided by the definition of firearm, the definition of machine gun, and the relevant case law interpreting a weapon. May be readily converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive and readily restored to shoot. This rule accepts the statutory concepts and the case law so that ATF's regulation more plainly indicate that a clearly identifiable component part of a weapon becomes a frame or receiver when it may readily be completed, assembled, restored, or otherwise converted to function as a frame or receiver to house or provide or structure for the primary energized component of the handgun breaching sealed component of a projectile weapon other than a handgun or internal sound component. God, so basically they're just saying, I can't even... This is so frustrating. So I'm going to keep reading it, but man, holy crap. I have to read this again just to rag on it. Are you seeing the, the pieces? These are like a bunch of Tetris blocks. I mean, I can tell because I'm reading these things over and over again, but they're just dropping the same Tetris blocks. They're like, oh, you, you had this concern? Here's the Tetris block we're throwing at you. Oh, you had another concern? Here's a different Tetris block. Oh, you have your third concern? Here's that first Tetris block. This is really frustrating to have to read. So at this point, I'm sick of it. I'm gonna just, when I see these pieces that are just the Tetris box being dropped for the fourth or fifth time, I'm just gonna skip past. Uh, so basically we're still at the point where the ATF is, is acknowledging the comments and certain aspects of the comments that came in. They've already looked at all the ones that are pro fluff job of the ATF. And now we're looking at the ones that are critical of the ATF's bullshit and they're blowing them off one by one here. They're basically saying, here's a Tetris block of garbage. Here's a Tetris block of garbage. So this one is definition of destroyed frame or receiver. We wouldn't even have to worry about this if they didn't make a bunch of stupid laws. And now we have to worry about how to destroy stupid property that we don't even want so that it doesn't come back to haunt us, right? I'm not saying that the government is acting like the Viet Cong did when the when the the soldiers were throwing away metal garbage and turning it into landmines and throwing it back at us, but it seems like they're weaponizing garbage over here. Um, so now uh, a few commenters opine the proposed definition of destroyed frame or receiver, which would not be considered a frame or receiver under the definition. Some stated that the definition for destroyed frame or receiver contradicts the definition for partially complete, disassembled, or inoperable frame or receiver, because according to the commenters, they are both in the same state and as not being operable to create a working firearm and therefore the ATF cannot regulate them as frames or receivers while also excluding them from the definition. Another commenter disagreed with the ATF's requirement that a cutting torch needs to be used to sever at least three critical areas of the frame or receiver to be an acceptable method of destruction. The commenter stated that for polymer frames or receivers, simply cutting the frame or receiver in three critical areas should be enough because it could never be repaired by a reverse process that a cutting torch is unnecessary to permanently destroy polymer frames. 
And the ATF's response to that is the department disagrees that the definitional definitional supplement concerning destroyed firearms or receivers contradicts the supplement titled partially complete, disassembled, or inoperable, now non-functional frame or receiver. Under that supplement, a partial complete disassembled or non-functional frame or receiver is considered a frame or receiver if it is designed to or may be readily converted to readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. The supplement does not address destruction, which is addressed in the supplement entitled destroyed for frame or receiver. A destroyed frame or receiver is one that has been permanently altered such that it is not readily be completed, assembled, restored, or otherwise converted to function as a frame or receiver. That supplement further explains how destruction may be accomplished completely melting, crushing, or shredding, oh my God, or other method approved by the director. It has to be, guns need to be dealt with like a Terminator robot. The torch cut method is the proposed rule was cited only as one acceptable method, but it is not the only method to avoid confusion on this issue. The final rule replaces the stated methods with or other method approved by the director. How stupid. So basically the question was, hey, why do we have to torch cut a piece of plastic, you idiots? And their response is, oh, no, you don't have to torch cut it because you can also melt it, crush it, or shred it. Assholes. Okay, so the next one is, I'm trying not to comment really hard. Readily, the definition of the word readily. Numerous commenters criticized the proposed definition of readily which would be relied upon to determine in part if a partially completed frame or receiver falls under the definition of frame or receiver or if a weapons part kit falls under the definition of firearm. The overwhelming concern raised was that the definition of readily is a non-exclusive list of numerous factors, none of which is controlling and which includes subject subjective considerations that could leave it unclear to the industry and public when an item meets a particular definition. Commenters, for instance, explain that parts could be a firearm if an expert using specialized tools assembled it in 10 minutes if the ATF were to focus on the factors of time and ease. Alternatively, those same parts assembled in that scenario might not be a firearm if the ATF were to focus on the factors of expertise and equipment. Similarly, others argued that all the terms were uh, impermissibly vague or arbitrary. For example, these commenters stated that expertise is wholly subjective and the ATF did not identify what knowledge or skills is essential to making a firearm. One trade group stated that several major manufacturers communicated that as many as seven or more stages of a pistol's construction be could be called into question as the proposed definition because it was not clear when a frame or receiver is readily completed. Each stage of the process, the group argued, could require serialization and record keeping. The group said that changing the standard of requiring serialization from only finished products to those which are readily completed is confusing to both manufacturers and their suppliers. Additionally, as mentioned above, manufacturers expressed concern that the products they receive from non-licensed third-party suppliers could fall under the definition of partially complete. Various commenters argued that the expansive definitions of readily when applied to a partially complete frame or receiver could result in steel or aluminum billets, casting forges, or even simple glass reinforced nylon raw materials being considered firearms. Numerous commenters focused on the factor of time under the proposed definition of readily, arguing that it's not an adequate factor without more specifically to by which to measure if a weapon's parts kits are partially completed frame or receiver may be readily converted or assembled into a firearm. Commenters pushed back against the ATF's reliance on some of the court cases ATF cited as support for the factors to define the term readily. They stated several of the cases are from the 1970s to discuss how a wide range that constitutes readily convertible ranging from 12 minutes to one hour to eight hour working day in a properly equipped machine shop. Thus, what would one ex what one expert may accomplish easily in 20 minutes may require hours of hard work for a novice. One manufacturer, Polymer 80, also critiqued ATF, ATF for not supplying a metric for time and for stating in a footnote that Polymer 80 assembly could be completed in 30 minutes, leaving the company to wonder if 30 minutes is the standard. One commenter suggested that eight hours of work would be a reasonable threshold. I got to take a break. Chocolate coffee. 
Some commenters believe that ATF's own ruling and public statements in cases such as California versus ATF mentioned above contradict the notion that it's easy to finish lower receivers with simple possession of hand tools in a way that would bring them under the definition of frame or receiver. Commenters argue that the process of converting an unfinished lower receiver into a finished lower receiver requires specialized equipment, precision tools, skills, and time. Users, according to the commenters, must purchase numerous parts and assemble them with care. Similarly, other commenters under the assumption that an 80% lower would be included under the definition of partially complete frame or receiver argued that this item cannot fire blank cartridges, nor can it be readily converted to do so. Because the whole multiple holes have to be drilled and complex mechanical parts need to be attached. They stated that the AR-15 lower receiver is a frame or receiver once it becomes an integral component containing a fire control group and is attached via the takedown pins to the other components required to complete a firearm in the AR-15 design. Did I just lose internet? Internet YouTube censorship? Others pointed out technological advances such as CNC machines that can convert metal ingots into functional firearm, thus raising the question of whether a CNC machine sold alongside the ingots would be considered a firearm. Similarly, commenters questioned whether a 3D printer shipped with a filament and 3D files representations of firearms would constitute a firearm under the readily convertible test. Further, according to one commenter in a properly equipped machine shop today, it would not be uncommon for the shop to acquire a three-axis CNC machine with a fourth-axis trunnion for less than $10,000. According to the commenter, argued that existing case law upon which the ATF relies did not serve to narrow the classification and definition of readily convertible. Commenters asserted that no one can predict what instructions, guides, templates the ATF director will rely on in a given case. Commenters argued that ATF needs to remedy the definition with exact definitions of time, ease, expertise, equipment, availability, expense, and scope. Other commenters noted the term readily is used throughout the Gun Control Act in several contexts, including interstate transportation of firearms and for the import, importability of firearms, generally recognized as partly suitable for readily adaptable for sporting purposes. Commenters also noted that there are countless other terms, uses of the term readily throughout the ATF regulations. And do, 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 do. the commenters asserted the ATF's proposed definition will impact all other places where the term readily qualifies certain provisions that the ATF proposed non-exclusive lists of factors would not provide clarity in those contexts either. What the hell does that mean? One commenter suggested that the term readily be removed from the proposed definition so it reads, the term firearm or receiver shall include the case of a frame or receiver that is partially complete, disassembled, or inoperable, a frame or a receiver that has reached a stage in manufacture where it is clearly identifiable, biomechanical properties, material composition, geometry, or other function as an unfinished component part of a weapon. For purposes of the de definition, the partially complete, as it modifies frame or receiver, meaning a forging, casting, extrusion body, machine body, or similar article. Other commenters questioned whether solvent traps, what, which, what are they doing to us? They're giving us like a bunch of crap. It's like the garbage can of crap. And then they just come in and go, here's a Tetris piece. We don't, we don't acknowledge any of this. All right. Commenters. So it was all AR-15 stuff. And now other commenters questioned whether solvent traps, which are asserted are legitimate devices and sometimes resemble some silencers would be considered readily convertible under the new regu regulations. Okay, readily convertible, I guess. Although some individuals file an ATF Form 1 under the NFA to make solvent trap silencers, the commenter stated that persons using solvent traps as actual solvent traps would be allowed to transfer them across state lines without viol violating the Gun Control Act or being subject to the NFA. The fact that they're even changing rules that jump between a receiver and a, a solvent trap shows that they're either inept or strategically brilliant. All right, so the response from the ETF on that pile of slop was, <clears throat> is the department disagrees that the term readily and the relaxed, or no, the related non-exclusive list of factors when classifying firearms should be removed from the rule. As stated previously, the term readily has been adopted to determine when a firearm is considered a firearm under code and when the critical stage of manufacture has occurred in which an unfinished component part of a weapon becomes a frame or receiver under code. 
to explain the meaning of that term, this first rule, wait, the rule first sets forth a common dictionary definition of the term, then provides more clarity on how the term readily is to be used to clarify, classify firearms by listing relevant factors that courts have adopted when making that determination. So basically they said, from what I understand here, people are upset with us because of the way we defined it. And then they go, oh no, we don't care about what you said because we've already defined it. So they have said nothing here except no. Oh, it's not trying to comment, but this is frustrating. All right, the department disagrees that these factors should incorporate minimum time limits, percentages of completion or levels of expertise or otherwise create thresholds to determine when a weapon or frame or receiver parts are readily con converted. Enumerating in this rule how each of these factors would allow the manifold designs and configurations of firearms and aggregations of firearm parts now in existence or to those that may produce in the future would be difficult if not impossible. You know what's difficult or not impossible? Understanding that stupid ass sentence. Enumerating in this rule how each of the factors would apply to the manifold designs and configurations of firearms and aggregations of firearm parts now in existence or to those that may be produced in the future would be difficult or not impossible. Who the Somebody got paid to write that sentence and put it in here. Now we have to deal with it. That's like making a pothole out of, like when they make the pothole out of some like, I don't know, like using a, grandfather clock to fill potholes like yeah it fills the pothole but come on man you're seriously spent all the time and effort to put a grandfather clock in there you could have just said it's difficult when things are complicated anyway however the department agrees that more clarity as to how the term readily is applied is applied would help however the department agrees that more clarity as to how the term readily is applied would help address commenters concerns in the final rule, the department one expressly excludes from the definitions of frame or receiver unformed blocks of metal, liquid polymers, and other raw materials. Two changes the term inoperable to the more accurate term non-functional. We've heard that answer before because that really explains a lot. A holes. Number three expressly exclude includes frame or receiver parts kits. So now we've done that. Oh my god! And then four explains the meaning of functional state. Five provides detailed examples of when an unassembled or damaged frame or receiver or frame or receiver parts kit or partially complete billet or blank, as the case may be, would be considered a frame or receiver because it may be readily be completed, assembled, restored, or otherwise converted to a functional state. Although it would indeed be difficult, if not impossible, for ATF to provide examples of every possible state of completion or configuration of weapons or weapons parts. The proposed definition provides clarity on how the term readily is applied to the definition of firearm and numerous courts have upheld the application of that term in related criminal and civil cases against constitutional vagueness challenges. <laughs> what a bunch of dicks. Holy moly, this is tough to not comment on, but this is basically horrible, horrible, heinous horribleness. The department disagrees that the application of the term readily in this rule will require manufacturers to serialize and record frames or receivers in each stage of the manufacturing process. First, the final rule expressly excludes from the definition of frame or receivers, forgings, casting, printing, exclusions, unmachined bodies, or similar articles that have not yet reached the stage of manufacture where they are clearly identifiable as unfinished component parts of a weapon, such as unformed blocks of, oh my God, metal, liquid polymers, and other raw materials. Thus, this is the cause of stress in the world, whoever wrote this sentence. Thus, it is not until articles have been fashioned into unfashioned frames or receivers that they are subject to the readily converted standard. Manufacturers and importers should already know that, un that these items have been regulated as defense articles for purposes of importation and exportation for many decades. What? Second, the examples in the final rule illustrate only once a frame or receiver blank or billet is produced for sale or distribution must a determination be made whether the seller distributor of the items or kit provides or makes available to the purchaser or recipient of the item or kit and associated template jig or tool that would allow the purchaser or recipient of the billet blank or complete the frame or receiver or fairly reasonably efficiently, quickly, and easily. Holy crap. Companies that sell or distribute only unfinished frames or receiver billets or blanks and not any associated jigs, templates, or similar tools to the same customer are not required to be licensed <laughs> or to mark those articles with identifying information. So 
every single thing they've even done here is just undone right there because they don't even care or give a shit that if you're going to sell your templates and your jigs and your blanks somewhere else what a bunch of idiots this is definitely designed to be a distraction that cost a bunch of money and it's causing a bunch of effort too so this is a razor blade slice do you think is this a razor blade slice or is this a uh a uh, ice pick jab it's one of the two we're bleeding but it's all about where they jabbed it right but if this is a bump stock maneuver like let's just bump and move and maybe it was an ice pick jab you know maybe we're bleeding out in a kidney into our cavities i don't even know all right this is tough to read However, companies, yeah, whatever, tell, basically say, oh, yeah, yeah. So anybody that reads this can just make two companies, I guess. Finally, under this rule, the licensed manufacturers who receive non-firearm billets or blanks are not required to mark the item, mark them until after the entire manufacturing process has ended for the exam for the complete weapon. For the frame or receiver to be sold, shipped, or distributed separately, as the case may be, seven days in the case of the gun control firearms and by close of the next business day for NFA firearms. The department agrees with commenters who said the term readily has other applications in the statute and regulations that has nothing to do with the enumerated factors. For this reason, the department has made minor changes to this definition in the final rule to make clear that the term can apply to the, any process, action, or physical state, and the listed factors relate only to the firearms classifications as follows. A term that describes a process, action, or physical state that is fairly or reasonably efficient, quick and easily, but not necessarily the most efficient, speediest, or easiest process, action, or state. With respect to the classification of firearms under this part, factors relevant in making this determine include the following. All right, now with regard to certain items marked as solvent traps, the definition of firearm silencer means any definition for silencing, muffling, or diminishing the report of a portable firearm, portable firearm, including any combination of parts designed or redesigned and intended for use in assembling or fabricating a firearm silencer or muffler of and any part intended only for use in such assembly or a so-called solvent trap that has been indexed for the purpose of allowing the end user to drill a hole for the passage of a projectile to diminish the report of a portable firearm is intended only for the fabrication of a silencer. It is by definition a firearm silencer without regard to the definition of the term readily or the application of the term may be readily. Oh, you guys already got rid of that for me? I'm going to take a second to look over at the poll then. If you would just make a bunch of comments so this thing goes away. Thanks for that. All right, so we got a poll going with 19 votes and restrictions. Okay, what is the worst part of these new rules? Is it the uh, restrictions on parts kits and 80 percenters? Is it the new industry obligations? Is it the distraction of these ghost guns? Uh, is it that it might be ignored like the bump stocks were ignored and then... Well, I suggest that the ignoring, ignoring ignoring, and the lack of action on the bump stocks is what created this situation or the reason they thought they could get away with this. Anyway, so go ahead and, uh, yeah, just type a bunch of stuff and it'll go up and away. Appreciate that. I'm seeing it over here. Oh, what's happening? Oh, I guess it's just hidden. So I got to go find, that's weird. Oh, I guess it's because it's on this. There we go. I, I thought somebody was killing this for me. Let me just kill this really quick. First, I like to report it as, what is it? Oh, it's hate speech, right? So we'll get rid of that one as hate speech. And then that way the account is reported to the system as hate. And then, of course, we hide the user on the channel, which will remove in one click what they wasted a bunch of time, wasting their time on. And then if you all would just make some note, some clicks, you know, comments or whatever, then it'll all disappear. There we go, thanks. So um, yeah, going back to it, I guess. Um, definition of complete weapon. Let me... Uh,
Pull over here. Is that thing still coming? Oh, they have more than one account. So we'll just do the same thing. Reported as hate speech and violence. And then there you go. All right. Some commenters argued that the ATF's definition of a complete weapon is illogical because it includes a firearm that contains all component parts necessary to function as designated whether or not, or no, as designed, whether or not assembled or operable. They objected to the inclusion of operability, stating that if it is inoperable, it is not a weapon. They also objected to inclusion of an unassembled weapon as they believe this inclusion would create tremendous amount of a tremendous enforcement uncertainty. Yeah. So commenters asserted that law-abiding gun owners who legally own both AR rifles and pistols could be charged with a felony if they store their rifles unassembled. Other commenters stated that the definition, well, lame. so we report as hate speech and then just delete, it's not easy. Commenter asserted that law-abiding gun owners who legally own both rifles could be charged as a felony if they store them unassembled. Other commenters stated that the definition of complete weapon only generates confusion because, in their view, a firearm would legally be a firearm whether or not as a complete weapon. Um, for reasons previously discussed, the department disagrees that inoperable firearms are not weapons and that the application of the definition of firearms to unassembled weapons creates enforcement uncertainty. Firearms manufacturing is a continuum of raw material to into a functional item and the terms complete weapon is needed to explain when the firearm receiver of, or of a weapon in the process of being manufactured must be identified and recorded by the regulation, specifically under this rule, frames or receivers of non-NFA weapons that are in the process of being manufactured as part of complete weapons may be marked and recorded by a licensed manufacturer for up to uh, seven days after the entire manufacturing process for the complete weapon has ended. Complete NFA weapons consistent with the record keeping requirement uh, must be marked uh, by close of the next business day and after manufacture, uh, some complete weapons may be sold in unassembled configurations or may be uh, inoperable due to poor workmanship or design. But the fact that a complete weapon is sold or dis distributed unassembled or happens to be currently inoperable does not remove the requirement from requirement for identifying markers to be placed on the firearm or receiver. Uh, let's see, back over here. And report that one again. And there you go. So free platforms aren't free because anonymous logins allow for uh, harassment. So again, if people are listening live and you're a human, not a robot or some kind of crazy person, is literally as you know, messed up brain cells, then go ahead and type something so that it gets rid of that shit and I can bring the comments back over. But right now, just a bunch of weird stuff abuse i don't feel like posting the abuse on the screen here so regular humans that are out there if you want to comment something go for it otherwise we'll just sit here not doing that all right so then uh the term complete weapon i think it does that is also used in the rule to explain that frames or receivers and other parts defined as firearms that are not component parts of a complete weapon at the time they are sold shipped or disposed of must be marked with all the required markings within the specified time limits from completion so they can be traced um, if lost or stolen. The term, thanks for that. Appreciate the help there because I don't like having this thing over to the side. It's too hard to look at my peripherals. So I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. The term is also needed to explain what is meant by our two conspicuously marked firearms with serial numbers and other marks of identification. Markings must be obstructed by other markings when the complete weapon is assembled. Whew. 
Definition of privately made firearms. One organization stated that the definition of personally made kits, personally made firearms, which does not include firearms made prior to 1968 unless remanufactured after that date, does not distinguish between a commercially made pre-1969 firearm and those made privately. The organization stated that sometimes one cannot tell if a firearm has had its several serial number defaced or removed. As a result, according to the organization, dealers will decline to transfer or sell a firearm with no serial, guard, serial number without regard to whether or not it's a personally made firearm. Further, an individual may or may not know or can be wrong or misled a dealer about whether a particular firearm is a personally made firearm or just an old firearm. Other commenters suggest, objected on the grounds that thousands of gun owners who bought or made firearms prior to 1969 would become criminals because there's no way to tell if the firearms, which do not have serial numbers, were made before or after 1969. You bet. Thanks for making it possible. The department agrees. So this is the ATF's response to that. The department agrees that the exclusion for pre October 1968 firearms from the definition of personally made firearms does not distinguish between firearms that were made commercially from those that were personally made privately made because that definition of control act and on or after that date. To make this clear, the final rule adds the term manufactured to that exception. However, the department disagrees that pre 1968 exclusion from the definition of personally made kits raises concerns because it is not difficult for licensees to know if a firearm, whether or not if it's a personally made firearm, was manufactured prior to 1968. First, 1968 firearms in circulation generally have some marks of identification. Personally made firearms, by definition, are not marked with a serial number placed on a by a person licensed and as manufacturer under the Gun Control Act at a time when the firearms were produced. Regulations implementing the firearms, the Federal Firearms Act of 1938 required all firearms manufactured after 1958 to be identified with the name of the manufacturer or importer, a serial number, caliber, and model. See Internal Revenue Service, blah, blah, blah. The only exception from marking the serial number and model requirements was for shotguns and 22 caliber rifles not subject to the NFA. Thus, the name of the manufacturer and caliber would still be marked on commercially produced weapons, even though even though this subset of GCA firearms may not display a serial number or model, though some will. Let's just take a second and notice that we're talking about firearms made pre-1968. What the hell was made in 1968 that isn't a 22 or a, a shotgun? And they have the balls to say commercially all commercially produced weapons, even though this subset of whatever. What a bunch of conniving. It's a bunch of conniving. Is that the right word? Like what a bunch of horrible people. Second, there are a few firearms in circulation manufactured prior to 1969 that were not commercially produced. As this rule explains, only in the past few years has technology advanced to allow individuals to quickly and easily make their own firearms for, for personal use from kits or 3D printers. Come on. They are stupid. Third, if a person is in doubt about whether a particular particular firearm without any markings was manufacturer made prior to 1968. There are many licensee and non-licensee experts who can evaluate the firearm, provide an expert opinion, including as to whether or not the serial number on the firearm has been altered or obliterated. <laughs> Additionally, persons may voluntarily seek a determination from ATF as to whether a particular firearm is subject to regulation using the procedure provided in this rule. That is disgraceful. I don't like anything about that answer, personally. Next one is definitions of an importer or manufacturer serial number. A few commenters stated that the new definition of an importer or manufacturer serial number, which requires more information than under current regulatory scheme is confusing. They stated the term identification number, which is part of the definition of importers manufacturer serial number is not a defined term, though it seems to be referring to what industry understands to be an identification number. They pointed out the term serial number is, interchange is interchangeably used throughout the comment period in different sections to mean both the identification number and the newly defined term. The department, and this is the ATF's answer to that. The department agrees with these commenters that the clarification should be to the definition of importer or manufacturer serial number. First, the definition recognizes the, con the department recognizes the confusion that could be generated because the proposed definition of importers or manufacturer serial number stated 
when used in this part, the term serial number shall mean the importer or manufacturer serial number, while other parts of the proposed marking requirements use the term serial number to also refer to a number that would be placed after an FFL's abbreviated license number. For this reason, the final rule clarifies the definition by defining it as the serial number placed by a licensee on a firearm, including any full or abbreviated license number and any such identification on a privately made firearm the serial number issued by the director or a serial number issued by the director. It also specifies that for purposes of code, the term shall include any associated licensee name or licensee city state placed on a firearm. The inclusion of serial number and the associated licensees information as part of the definition means these markings are protected, which prohibits possession of a firearm with a removed, oh my God, Limited or altered serial number. Because licensees have the option of marking the frame or receiver with either a serial number, oh my goodness, or the manufacturer, or importer, city, and state, a serial number beginning with the abbreviated licensee number and the name recognized abbreviation. The final rule also makes minor changes specifically in the sections used using the term unique identification number to properly describe the identifying information that would follow an FFL's abbreviated license number or identification number placed on the maker of a personally made firearm. Furthermore, the rule also makes clear that the identification markers, including a unique identification number, must be legible, meaning that they must use exclusively Roman letters and Arabic numerals or solely Ar Arabic numerals. They have a massive fixation on serial numbers, and if we don't end this, it's never. This is more of an ice pick than a razor blade. This this serial number thing is more dangerous than a lot of things have been. Also, to avoid confusion in the regulations with the serial number marked on a firearm, the term transaction number was substituted for serial number when explaining some things. So this will ensure the sequential number. Okay, blah blah blah. Next is definition of a gunsmith. Comments received. Several commenters who identified as gunsmiths. <laughs> if you identify as a gunsmith, let us know in the comments. Several uh, commenters who identified as gunsmiths expressed concern about the ATF being superseded upon the effective date of the final rule. The ruling, some other thing, gunsmiths to perform various services for manufacturers and importers without needing to mark the firearm the commenter stated that the ruling is superseded. Gunsmiths would have to apply for a, mar a different type of manufacturer's license if they wanted to continue performing services for manufacturers. One custom gunsmith of 1911s provided an example of how the process of marking frames would be overly complex, if not impossible, to comply with the ruling if it were to be super if the ruling were to be superseded. First, the frame would have the original manufacturer's marking then as the builder of the custom pistol the commenter would place his company's markings on the frame or receiver then the markings of the licensee that provides the checkering would apply it. and finally the markings of the licensee that applies the specialized finish would be applied the commenters asked the etf to reconsider superseding or providing an exemption to allow custom gunsmiths and firearms manufacturers to each use each other's manufacturing processes without requirement to mark provided that the frame or receiver is machined, is marked in compliance before the outside service is provided. Are you seeing what's going on here? What they're doing here? Imagine what your gun's gonna look like. If you had a Ruger, imagine it's gonna be like reading your gun now. If you had a Ruger like grinded and painted. Similarly, one manufacturer said the proposed definition of gunsmiths is under-inclusive because it would allow gunsmiths to perform their services on existing firearms not for sale or distribu distribution by a licensee. The manufacturer stated that proposed change would preclude some type one licensed gunsmiths from conducting or continuing to perform manufacturing activities on the manufacturer's behalf because those firearms would ultimately be intended for sale and distribution by that manufacturer. The manufacturer stated that this would impact several production lines at all of its primary manufacturing facilities. Another commenter stated that the produced change to gunsmith implies that a person who is not a gunsmith would be prohibited from engraving a serial number onto a firearm. He stated that if a person makes a personally made firearm, that person should be able to serialize it. The department, this, this is the ATF's response to all of that. <clears throat> 
The department agrees that the new definition of gunsmith will result in the relicensing of many gunsmiths as manufacturers when they are involved in the production of firearms for sale or distribution by licensees. This is because persons engaged in the business of manufacturing for the purpose of sale or distribution by completing assembling are making themselves are required to be licensed as manufacturers. What a bunch of assholes. This is made clear in the revised definition of gunsmith in the final rule. So they're like, hey, we don't like the way you made gunsmith rules or the way you define gunsmith because it makes us have to do a bunch of stuff. And they're like, oh, no, that's okay because we want you to have to do a bunch of stuff. Nevertheless, in light of commenters' concern regarding the differences between gunsmithing and manufacturing, the final rule also makes clear that licensed dealer gunsmiths are not required to be licensed as manufacturers if they perform gunsmithing services only on existing firearms for their customers or for another licensee's customers because the work is not being performed to create firearms for sale or distribution. The firearm in which the gunsmith service was performed is merely being returned to the individual from which it was received. These services may include customizing a customer's complete weapon by changing its appearance through painting, camouflaging, or engraving, applying protective coatings, or replacing the original barrel stock or trigger mechanism with drop-in replacements. Assholes. Laser or licensed dealer gunsmiths may also purchase complete weapons, make repairs, and resell them without being licensed as manufacturers. Likewise, under the final rule, licensed dealer gunsmiths may make such repairs for other licensees who plan to sell or resell them without being licensed as a manufacturer. They may also place marks of identification on the personal firearms they may purchase and sell, or under the direct supervision of another licensee in accordance with this rule. These activities are distinguished from persons who engage in the business of completing or assembling parts or parts kits, applying coatings, or otherwise producing new or remanufactured firearms, frames, or complete weapons for sale or distribution. Such persons must be licensed as manufacturers. Assholes. Uh, license, let's see, do, 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 uh, whatever is this saying? License, what is this? And what it, I don't know what this is saying. This is just like a half of a sentence there for no reason. The department also agrees that superseding this other rule by could be burdensome to licensed gunsmiths required to be licensed as manufacturers because they would now be required to place their own identifying markers and markings on firearms already marked by a licensed manufacturer import. For this reason, the rule is finalized allow licensed manufacturers, including persons formerly licensed as dealers licensed as licensed gunsmiths to adopt a serial number and other identifying marks previously placed on a firearm by another license without a variance. What? Provided that the firearm has not been sold, shipped, or otherwise disposed of to another person in a licensee. That's stupid. This change will also reduce the potential for, con yeah, right, by confusion by law enforcement, which, yeah, right. Well, to, yeah, whatever. They're stupid. So this is pretty good. So now you can, if you want to murder people, according to this stupid law, you can become a painter and you can take guns in and you can go around killing people with them, and then you can give them back to whoever you painted them for, and that person's responsible because your name is never going to be on it. These are stupid rules. Stupid rules. Horrible, stupid rules. All right, this change also would reduce the potential for confusion by law enforcement with chasing a firearm involved in a crime if multiple markings were upon on those. This is stupid. Under these circumstances, there's a reduced concern that a trace could not be... They're, these are, they're fixated on trace. We need to remove tracing and serial numbers from the paradigm already. This is ridiculous. All right. However, the change would reduce the potential for confusion by law enforcement when tra tracing a firearm involved in a crime if multiple markings would have been found on these firearms. Under these circumstances, there is a reduced concern that a trace could not be successful because the required records maintained by those licensees would reveal a continuous acquisition and disposition of that firearm. Assholes. However, once a firearm is sold, shipped, or otherwise disposed of to a person other than a licensee, the, tra the trace can be completed only to the first retail purchaser. After that point, it is difficult to trace the firearm to another licensed manufacturer that may have purchased it for remanufacture, resale, or distribution without the purchaser's own identifying markings. For this reason, the final rule distinguishes between the licensee adoption of markings on new firearms from those that were already introduced into commerce and non-licensees, such as those that are being remanufactured or imported. Additionally, the final rule also allows licensed gunsmiths and licensed manufacturers that conduct gunsmithing activities to adopt the existing markings on firearms when they engage in gunsmithing activities on firearms that are not for sale or distribution. <sighs> These changes will thereby supersede the other stuff. Furthermore, the final rule expressly clarifies that licensed manufacturers and importers, when are, which are permitted to act as licensed dealers without obtaining separate... A uh, dealer's license can perform adjustments or repairs on firearms for their customers without recording an acquisition. P 
provided the firearm is returned to the person from whom it was received on the same day. I'm waiting for a text from somebody, so let me go look. No, oh, that's not them, I guess. Person I'm texting has a 480, that's not them. Um, finally, with regards to personally made firearms, the department agrees that licensed dealer gunsmiths and other licensees that accept the privately made guns into inventory should be allowed to otherwise adopt a unique identifying number placed by a non-licensee if that identifying number otherwise meets the marketing requirements. This allowance is reflected in the final rule. However, these licensees would still be required to place their abbreviated license number as a prefix followed by a hyphen to the existing serial number. This is stupid so that the firearm could be traced to them. What do they seriously think? How stupid are they? This is just garbage. What do they think you can just type serial numbers because you feel like it? That there's just metal to spare everywhere? Just, hey, there's extra metal because the government wanted more serial numbers. This is ridiculous. Just garbage to read. Overall, the department believes these provisions of the rule as finalized will mitigate the marking burden on licensees and make it easier for them to purchase and sell PMFs while maintaining traceability for law enforcement. If it helps, you can think of me as that, what's her name? Uh, the, the news lady. I'm that news lady with the red hair that talks for Biden. Just think of it as her reading this whole thing, and that'll make it go down easier. We'll circle back to this next portion. Uh, concerns with marking requirements for firearms. The information required to be marked on firearms. We're not even on page 200, by the way. Numerous commenters, including retailers and manufacturers, objected to new marking requirements on multiple frames of receivers on personally made guns, arguing that the requirements would be too burdensome and confusing. Several manufacturers raised questions about what would be required of them. Some expressed confusion as to whether manufacturers and imported or importers are to mark multiple parts of a single weapon with the different serial numbers, or if they are to mark separate components of a single weapon with the same serial number, also asked Others asked if manufacturers are to present split or modular firearm configurations, uh, would continue to mark only the part they presently mark, or if the rules would require them to mark more than one part until they receive a classification. Other manufacturers observed that if a single firearm will have two or more frames or receivers, the manufacturer will produce and serialize them as separate parts at different times in different production lines. If separate parts will be separate firearms and the serial number on each uh, will duplicate the serial number on the other until they are put together, the separate firearms may sit in separate bins unassembled, all the while continuing to have duplicate serial numbers, thus violating the regulation against duplicate serial numbers. There are, There is also a risk the manufacturer stated that frames or receivers with different serial numbers could be mixed up during the production or distribution or even by the end user, resulting in firearms with two different serial numbers. <gasps> Oh, what? It took till page 195 to address the idea that you could have two different serial numbers on an AR-15 at this stupid situation? 195 pages before they address the idea of an AR-15 having a different upper and lower put together. Seriously. At, one, at least one manufacturer did not understand why the rule would require manufacturers to mark the caliber and model on more than one frame or receiver if the alternate... If the alternative... This marking could otherwise appear solely on the barrel or pistol slide. Another manufacturer stated that although it's technically possible to serialize more than one part, for a small manufacturer to coordinate all of these components into batches for the various models and configurations with the machine engraved numbers would be challenging and very expensive. The manufacturer pointed out that if all items are marked in advance and if any one part fails a quality control process, it would lose the value of the other three components and the manufacturer's scrap costs would increase significantly. Huh. Commenters ass asserted that the, in the case of modular type weapons, such, an existing, such as existing AR-15s, owners would be required to place serial numbers on parts that did not previously require them or would be prevented from swapping out upper and lower receivers, which is commonly done by firearms owners. Similarly, Another commenter said that without limiting the fire control components, videos that show 16 items in a typical Glock semi-automatic pistol would each be considered a frame or receiver and thus need to be serialized and tracked. Others asked if there would be a controlling serial number for the firearm in the event that the serialized parts are exchanged and the firearm has one, more than one serial number. 
Additional commenters worried that the new definitions and marking requirements would make transfer and background checks of firearms very confusing and potentially costly. Commenters argue that even if consumer thinks he or she is purchasing only one firearm, the reality is that a firearm with numerous serial numbers would need separate background checks, which in some states would mean additional fees. Others argued that this would create a mess for record keeping and trigger multiple sales reporting. They stated that if a firearm has multiple frames of receivers, each part with a different serial number is a firearm onto itself. They question whether an FFL selling this type of firearm. This all froze up would be required to file a multiple handgun sales report or for the retails in the states of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, the border states with Mexico, fulfill the multiple rifle reporting requirement. So if you didn't know, anytime you buy more than one rifle within a five day period in the states of California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, the ATF needs to be informed about your multiple purchase. That happens in every, every gun shop in these five states four states sorry fulfill the multiple okay whatever others argued that the comment period did not address states where residents are limited to purchasing only one handgun a month they argued that if a firearm has multiple frames of receiver each of which is a firearm by law then the individuals are prevented from buying a handgun in states with these limitations another issue that several commenters raised is that they would not be able to fit all the new information on certain parts that would now be considered frames or receivers for example they stated that the rules require serial number on an internal or drop-in chassis frame or receiver to be unobstructed to the naked eye commenter said this is unclear how a manufacturer can place safely place a lengthy abbreviated ffl number and the other requirements in the window of a polymer frame so that the required information is visible they stated that the inability to fit the new marking requirements is even more acute on smaller pistols or on certain hero and relic bolt action firearms. Another manufacturer said it would need to design and acquire dozens of new molds to fulfill new requirements for marking and a typical mold costs approximately $100,000. The manufacturer stated it would also need to essentially modify all molds for polymer grip frames with the extended marking requirements such as by measuring from the flat surface of the metal and not peaks and ridges and by ensuring the marks are not susceptible to obliteration. This manufacturer also inquired on how FFLs are supposed to measure the depth of markings after certain coatings are applied. Assuming the grip frames and trigger assemblies will be frames on receivers, uh, the manufacturer stated that it would have to modify each grip or trigger assembly to include a metallic plate suitable for marking a serial number, which would increase the cost for itself and suppliers for those costs. It would also require it to obtain a marketing variance, a marking variance. Uh, and it's getting tough again. This is good stuff, though, because this is where the industry is being pushed around. So, there's a lot in this. There's a lot in this. A mentor wrote that the new markings requirement could be satisfied by slowly, solely marking the licensee's name and RDS code plus a unique RDS plus and that RDS plus would satisfy a unique serial number requirement. The commenter expressed confusion because the preamble indicates that the RDS plus suffix would include alphabetic characters, but the rule, despite defining legibility, seems to limit the suffix to numerals only as the rule uses the term number in several locations. The commenter indicated that the contradictory information between the explanation in the preamble and the regulatory text itself is problematic because all manufacturers use alphabetic characters in their serial numbers. Other commenters pointed out that modular lower can have its caliber changed into the absent and upper. There is no way to manufacture can mark a weapon with its caliber. They stated that the caliber should not be required on modular type weapons. They also asserted that requiring the caliber to be marked would be futile because owners can simply change the caliber by replacing the upper. So here's the ATF stupid response to all of that. The ATF previously, as stated previously, the department agrees with numerous commenters that there should only be one frame or receiver. Here we go with the Tetris blocks. In given weapon or device, the department has therefore added a new definition of frame or receiver as described herein, the focus on one housing or structural component of a particular fire control or internal sound reduction component for a given weapon or device. Because of these revisions, there was almost always been one unique serial number marked on any such weapon or device, even if the components of a split or modular receiver 
weapon were removed and reassembled during different using different components to ensure that industry members and others can rely on ATF's prior classifications. Almost all the classifications and variants thereof have been grandfathered in the definition of frame or receiver. Receiver or frame designs that have been grandfathered under the definitions may continue to be marked in the same manner as before with the effective date of the rule. This change should address concerns raised by manufacturers that their costs would increase in order to mark their existing, you assholes, their existing frames or receivers with new marking requirements or record multiple markings in connection with complete weapons or complete muffler silencer devices and by retailers that would have been required to run more background checks for more items classified as the frame or receiver. That's not an answer. That is not an answer. In response to the comments on the content of the, that's not an answer. They did not answer that. That's not an answer. Uh, in response to comments on the content of the markings, the department agrees with the comment that there could be confusion in the regulatory text as the number that must be part, marked on the RDS key, described in the rule as the license he's abbreviated federal F, FFL license number. For this reason, the regulatory text has been amended to change the word number to the unique identification number, assholes. It doesn't even, it just added words to the word number and still leaves number in there. Where appropriate to ensure that its particular part is the serial number in that scenario. The unique identification number may include both alphabetic and numeric characters as stated in the definition of legibility. <laughs> Assholes. The department disagrees with the comment saying the caliber or gauge could not be required marking for split or modular weapons. Information concerning the caliber or gauge of a weapon is useful to distinguish between firearms during a trace or when matching projectiles to a particular weapon found at a crime scene. To mitigate the problem raised by commenters that modular weapons caliber can change, the final rule makes clear that the model designation and caliber or gauge may be omitted if that information is unknown at the time of the frame or receiver sold, shipped, or otherwise disposed of separately from the complete weapon or the complete silencer, assholes. Markings on split or modular frame receiver. So they just blew off all that. They just blew off all that and didn't answer one and then sort of answered the second one and blew off everything else in there. Every single one of these is uh, worthy of focus and shame to the ATF and whoever allowed them to put this out and the fact that they hid this in 390 pages, 360 pages, this is, this is indicative of how unscrupulous bureaucracy allows assholes to be. These are, this is tyrant tyranny. Tyranny isn't necessarily just the front muzzle of a machine gun in your face, you know, that's scalding you and just got done shooting everyone around you. Tyranny is when they uh, slowly twist this kind of bullshit into the system where you can't do, or there's very little you can do immediately about it. And it requires consistent effort with a lot of people to resist it you know it's very difficult they know this this is tyranny right here oh my goodness very very difficult to deal with this stuff what they've accomplished is getting a lot of people who aren't willing to fight to sit down there's no way somebody's going to listen to this and get rallied up most people are going to sit down and take this they're not going to stand up to this this is a lot of little cuts a lot of little cuts were they geniuses or whether they stumble into this Let's see what the thing is over here. 22 votes. What is the worst part of this whole thing? It looks like it's pretty much split between how the distraction of ghost guns, the new industry obligations, and the restrictions on parts kits. Nobody's worried about it being ignored by, by bump stocks. While there's 10 people watching this and probably a bunch of people that heard about this and moved on, now they're worried about maybe Georgia. You know, they can cheer about Georgia. This, they got to read for however many hours. So being ignored by bump stocks, is that happening right now? Are we seeing that happen? Either way, I'm going to go pee. So I'll be back in a minute. Y'all are going to get a minute to take a break. Do whatever you want. I'll be back.
right. Middle of page 200, I think. Next section, markings on split or modular frames or receivers. Some manufacturers asked how they would handle warranty repairs on a modular or split frame receiver under the common period if one of the marked parts must be replaced to make the firearm safe to use. They stated that the manufacturer would not be able to provide a replacement part because it cannot reuse the serial number or return the firearm with unmarked components that are now considered to be the frame. They did. If they did, the replacement part would be marked with a different serial number, placing the manufacturer in violation of the code. They also asked if disassembly, routine cleaning, would classify as a frame or receiver, would constitute removal of the manufacturer's serial number in violation of code. And the ATF's response to that, unlike the proposed rule, this final rule does not require multiple parts of a split frame receiver to be marked. Thus, serial, non-serialized parts of a split frame receiver may be replaced without violating section whatever. However, the final rule explains that similar module, some, the modular subparts of a multi-piece frame or receiver must be marked with the same serial number and associated licensee information. If one of those parts is removed and replaced with an unserialized part, then the possessor would violate whatever for possessing a firearm with a removed serial number. <laughs> However, the final rule sets forth by a process by which a marked modular non subpart of a non NFA multi piece frame or receiver may be removed and replaced without violating. Assholes. The replacement modular subpart must be marked by its manufacturer with the same original serial number and the associated licensee information, and the original part must be destroyed what assholes, to prior to such placement. That is ridiculous. More specifically, the ATF has authority to prescribe by regulations the manner in which the licensed manufacturers and importers must identify serial number on the frame or receiver of a weapon because multi-piece frames or receivers may be partitioned into similar modular subparts that could be produced and sold separately. Each subpart must be identified with the same serial number and associated licensee information so that the frame or receiver, once complete or assembled, can do a trace to the manufacturer. The serial number identified on each subpart must be the same number so that the complete frame or receiver does not have a serial number duplicated on any other frame or produced by the manufacturer. Once the modular subparts are aggregated as a complete multi-piece frame or receiver, a modular subpart identified with the serial number cannot be removed and replaced unless the destruction procedure set forth in this rule is followed. I say again, come on. Next is the size and depth of markings. Another issue raised by commenters is the feasibility of doing an engraving to meet the new size specifications. One organization stated currently the print size and depth limitations pertain only to serial numbers and, do, and not the additional information. The proposed change to require that the serial number and additional information be engraved to a depth of whatever and a print size no smaller than 16th of an inch would certainly make it difficult or impossible to comply. The department agrees with this. Okay, so the ATF's response is, the department agrees with this comment and has stated in the preamble of this proposed rule, the world would not change the existing requirements for size and depth of markings. Consequently, the text of this paragraph in the final rule is amended to clarify that only the serial number and the associated license number must be in a print, blah, blah, blah. So only the serial number and associated license number. So they're assholes. They just said, oh yeah, you don't want to write all that? Well, guess what? You can write all that. Assholes. Period of time to identify firearms. Some commenters were concerned that the seven day time limit in the proposed rule for qualified manufacturers to identify NFA firearms contradicts, contradicts existing law because whatever must be filed by the close of business day so some stupid thing for NFA dealers, and then they go blah, 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 and consistent with the close, which means they include a serial number for this reason. The final rule makes clear that the weapons and defined must be identified no longer than the seventh day. So big deal. They just lied or whatever again. Next is marking privately made firearms. Numerous commenters objected to the requirement that personally made firearms be serialized. Many believe that the proposed rule would require makers of kits that are non-NFA weapons to serialize their firearms and emphasize that it should be optional, not required for a person to serialize the person's own guns. They asserted that holding private individuals to the same standards as commercial or corporate FFLs is unreasonable and burdensome. 
Others pointed out that the personally made kit guns are from polymer or plastic, and there's no way to insert a piece of metal into them, which would be required by the proposed regulations unless they go to a dealer and pay for extensive modifications. Commenters also said that forcing dealers to mark kits with their licensee information simply because the kit owner took a firearm in for repair or upgrade is a cost for is an added cost because the dealers would have to obtain additional equipment that is not needed for their daily operations and could be subject to liability if their FFL information is attached to an, one of these guns. Commenters also asserted that the kit guns owners would not want their mark their guns marked and the ruler would therefore prevent them from getting their marks repaired by gunsmiths. The respect to marking kits, commenters claim that it would not be reasonable to expect FFL retailer to know how to safely serialize a custom kit gun because the safety of the firearm can be compromised if the markings are placed in a critical area. Moreover, commenters said that many FFLs would not have the capability to mark firearms with serial numbers and thus would not be able to acquire the non serialized personally made guns to other dealers for customers. Manufacturers and trade organizations sim sim organizations similarly stated that the kit guns are not subject to the quality control as a commercial gun would face more liability if they ran into problems adding a serial number to one of these kits. Other commenters discussed the burden associated with requiring kits to be marked at any time is received in the inventory, even if it's received for purposes of limited to activities such as bore sighting or on-site adjustments at sporting events. The commenter stated that the FFL would not be able to perform a function test or other quick gunsmithing without first recording it into the records and adding a serial number. Other commenter asked if an FFL would have to re-serialize one of these kit guns if the kit gun had been marked with a previous builder's own serial number. The commenter asserted it would be better for the ATF to provide a best practices recommendation on how FFL FFLs may mark a PFF rather than the application of the rule is that the makers of the kits would not be able to serialize their own kits because only FFLs would be able to serialize them. Commenters also stated that the marking requirements seem to require the use of lasers or engravers or CNC mill machines with engraving capabilities given the mandatory depth and size requirements, which commenters said would not be satisfied with simple and cheap engraving tools. Also, specifically with respect to these things, one SOT holder said, Metal plates on common personally made guns are often not large enough to engrave the proposed 10 plus character number, the ATF size requirements. The suggestion from ATF in the thing said that ATFs or FFLs embed metal plates into their kit guns, according to the commenter, does not comprehend the variety of materials, including epoxies, resins, and ceramics, thermoset plastics, and well-known materials such as Bakelite that do not allow for doing so. A few commenters asserted that seven days is not sufficient time for FFLs to mark these guns. Some argued there was no realistic way to mark a gun in seven days because extra time would be needed to disassemble a complete gun, mark it properly, or if the FFL had no resources to engrave a slide or serial number, then to FFL would have to send it out for marking, and it would be unlikely that that firearm would be marked within that time period if the businesses can do that marking and have don't have a backlog of work. Similarly, commenters argued that requiring FFLs or supervise the marking of the serial numbers in their own inventory within a seven day period would severely interrupt the ability to conduct business and they would likely turn away these marked guns to avoid the burdensome regulatory requirements. Others argued that the period of time should be extended to 21 days to account for delays, which could easily be caused by weather and fuel shortages or shipper incompetence when shipping these things to one another, such as a gunsmith for marking. Here's the ATF stupid ass reply to all this. As an initial matter, the department notes that nothing in this rule requires private individuals to mark their personally made non-NFA firearms or to present them to licensees for marking. Nothing in this rule requires licensees to accept mark these guns into inventory to mark them with the name of the private marker or to record the marker's name as the manufacturer of the firearm. This rule only requires that the personally made Firearm voluntarily taken into inventory by FFLs be marked by a serial number prefix with the license abbreviated license and do so in the FFL's record of acquisition. This requirement allows the personally made firearms to be traced directly to the licensee and not the private maker if later used in a crime. <laughs> Seriously. So they don't even care that it doesn't go to the person. They just want to do this to create problems. This rule explains in detail how accepting PMFs into inventory without serial numbers undermines the entire purpose of maintaining transaction records and other required records. Yeah, so let's get rid of the records and the reason for retaining them is ridiculous. 
For example, if multiple marked PMFs of the same type are accepted in inventory, each recorded only as a pistol, they would be indistinguishable from each other for tracing and law enforcement purposes. Even if a personally made firearm could be traced to a particular firearms licensee, there would be no information marked on that weapon that could be matched to a specific record keeping entry in either the acquisition or disposition book. For these reasons, the personally made firearms must be marked with a traceable serial number like other firearms, but they do not need to be marked with the name of the private maker. As the proposed rule, whatever typically would be marked permanently embedding a metal plate into the polymer. Just do that. Just make a metal plate into the polymer. No big deal. Most, if not many, personally made parts kits already have a metal plate embedded into the partially complete frame receiver for serialization purposes and to assist purchasers in complying with some so-called with some state, local, or international laws. If a licensee does not have the capability to mark or license, he can, the licensee can arrange for private individuals to have the private guns marked by another person before accepting them. Or after acceptance, arrange for personally made guns to be marked under the licensee's direct supervisions with the licensee's serial number. So who's supposed to mark them? another licensee come on man the department also disagrees that sheet that metal serial number plates cannot be embedded or overprinted into polymer materials or that serial number plates currently embedded within plates are not or cannot be made large enough <laughs> the department further believes that as technology develops it will become easier and cheaper for licensees to embed metal plates into polymer materials Although upon issuance of this rule, it may be difficult for licensees to mark some of them that might have been taken in inventory, like those that don't have the metal plates, the department believes that the final rule proves a sufficiently long grace or provides a sufficiently long grace period for them to arrange for them to be marked by another licensee. Specifically, licensees have from the date of the final rule until 60 days after the effective date to properly mark and identify. What a-holes. Just a-holes. Nonetheless, the department agrees with some commenters that licensees, including dealer gunsmiths, should be allowed to adopt unique identification number previously placed on a privately made firearm and a unique private marker that is not duplicated on another firearm of the licensee and otherwise meets the identification requirements of this section, provided that within the period and in the matter herein prescribed, the licensee legibly and conspicuously places or cause to be placed on the firearm or receiver. Therefore, the oh God, the licenses own abbreviated federal firearms license number, which is the first three and last five digits, followed by a hyphen before the existing unique identification number. Again, these markings will allow the personally made firearm to be traced by the licensee if later recovered at a crime scene. What outrageous, heinous heinous abuse right here this is horrible and just doesn't even care this is like somebody wearing a bunch of frilly shit with their powdered wig their little pinkies up and they're dropping little crumbs of their cake and they don't just give a shit this is horrible i can't believe anybody's listening to this and you're not punching a refrigerator right now i would be punching this punching bag behind me if i wasn't on live Finally, the department agrees with the comment that dealer gunsmiths as well as licensed manufacturers and importers should be allowed to perform a function test and quick repairs on a personally made gun. For this reason, the final rule clarifies that licensed dealers, gunsmiths, manufacturers, and importers may conduct same-day adjustments or repairs without having to place identifying markers on the record as receipt and an acquisition to, acquisition to subsequent disposition upon return. It is not a significant change from the proposed rule because it provides consistency for same-day adjustment or repair by treating the same the same guns as commercially produced firearms and they must be carted in inventory only if repaired overnight. ATF has long maintained that if a firearm is brought in for adjustment or repair when the person is there to wait while it is being adjusted or repaired, the gunsmith is able to return the firearm during the same business state. It's not necessary to list the firearm in the gunsmith's records as an acquisition. How about we just get rid of rid of the firearms acquisition books i'm gonna drink again if the gunsmith has possession of the firearm from one day to another longer or longer the firearm received by the gunsmith must be recorded as an acquisition and then a disposition by the gunsmith's a and d records upon return to the same customer however the final rule makes clear that a personally made gun 
must be recorded as an acquisition when it is marked for identification, including same day or on the split. The only, ex what? However, the final rule makes clear that a personally made firearm must be recorded as an acquisition whenever it is marked for identification, including same day or on the spot. The only exception is when a firearm is marked by another licensee under the licensee's direct supervision with the licensee's serial number because the firearm has already been recorded as an acquisition. What assholes. Adoption of identifying markings. Some commenters stated that the explanation of the co of comment period's preamble on the marking of privately made firearms indicated that FFLs must always mark in a, uh, privately made firearms upon acquisition even if the private mark has already added a serial number. Commenter stated that the markings uh, on a private gun with the manufacturer's name and location unique serial number is equivalent to the markings of a commercial firearm and therefore the regulation should account for guns that are already marked. Similarly, they raised questions about the effect of the proposed rule on NFA firearms that have been approved through the ATF form when have already recorded in the comment period. They asked if the original markings as done by the maker on the firearm and recorded the comment period can be adopted by the FFL that it requires the personally made gun. Others asked whether the new marking requirements would render the owners of pre-86 pre machine guns, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, and other weapons under the NFA compliant with the NFA, as many of these firearms only have the lower receiver serialized and not other parts that could be deemed a frame or receiver under the new rules. Here's the stupid ATF stupid response to those issues. The department agrees with commenters who said, the personally made firearms that were manufactured or made privately should be treated similarly to commercial firearms when they are received by the FFLs. The department therefore agrees that FFLs should be allowed to adopt unique identification number on privately made firearms if it otherwise meets the marking requirements. This final rule allows such adoption as an exception. However, unlike commercially produced firearms, private makers are not required to maintain records of production and transfer. And under the Gun Control Act, Firearms involved in crime are traced to licensee, not private makers. Stupid. For this reason, licensees wishing to adopt the unique identification numbers marked by a private maker on privately made firearms would still need to be abbreviated license number as a prefix, the unique identification number, so adopt it. In that way, the firearm can be traced to the licensee. Where is this? They have this, this concept that if they can trace a gun to the licensee, crime ends. This is, this is nonsense. This is ridiculous. With regard to privately made NFA firearms, the rule as proposed and finalized does not define the term privately made firearm to include NFA firearms that have been identified and registered in the code pursuant to the other code, United States Code, or any firearm manufactured on or before 1968. Uh, the, furthermore, as stated previously, the rule requires marking only of single component and grandfather's uh, all previous ATF classifications, except for partially completed disassembler non-functional frames or receivers, including kits and ATF determined were not firearm receivers as defined prior to this rule. Um, marking of muffler, silencer, frame or receiver. Again, seems like we did this one already. Numerous commenters asserted that silencer should not be regulated at all because they are used solely to protect a shooter's hearing by reducing the sound levels of firearms and do not make any firearm more dangerous or affect the function of a firearm under than managing recoil. Therefore, therefore, they argued there should be no requirements to mark or serialize these devices. They stated that almost no crimes outside of Hollywood movies are committed while using silencers and that unnecessary paperwork, taxes, wait times, and regulations have deprived firearms owners from obtaining the simple device that could help them with avoiding hearing loss. Others pointed out that there are a number of silencers without an outer tube, such as the Q something, and there is no clear way to fit such an device to fit such a device within the proposed rule. They recommended the rule be more flexible by allowing only for serialization requirements by determined by the model of silencer. The American Suppressor Association referenced ATF's current guidance to industry that the replacement of the outer tube is so significant event that it amounts to making a new silencer. Accordingly, ASA pointed out that under ATF's current guidance, the new silencer needs to be marked, registered, and transferred in accordance with the Gun Control Act and the NFA. American Suppressor Association asserted that this current guidance is unsupported by statute and should be addressed in the rules. The ASA opined that remaking the outer tube for a silencer does not constitute making of a new silencer under the NFA 
when such remaking is completing the original manufacturer of the silencer in question. A remake outer tube is marked with the same serial number as the replaced outer tube. Uh, ASA asked if the ATF allow for the replacement of a silencer's outer tube in these instances and opined that the rules new definition of a frame or receiver for silencers is a perfect forum for ATF to announce and codify this reconsideration. There's the stupid ATF's answer to that question. The department disagrees with the comments that silencers should not be marked with serial numbers. Both the Gun Control Act and the NFA regulate silencers as firearms. The Gun Control Act and the NFA require silencers, like other firearms, to be identified with a serial number, and they cannot be registered without a serial number. Uh, this sets forth that how silencers must be serialized. It makes it easier for manufacturers, importers, and marketers or makers to place serial numbers by requiring only one part of a fire or buffler silencer device be marked as a firearm muffler and to be marked on the other silencer parts with a transfer between qualified licensee for further manufacturer repair complete devices. There you go. Is that an answer? There's your answer. That's just a Tetris block again. With respect to modular silencers like the Q whatever, the final rule makes clear that in the case of modular firearms model, silencers, devices with more than one part that provides a housing or structure for the primary internal component designed to reduce the sound of the projectile, the term frame or receiver means the principal housing attached to the weapon that expels a projectile, even if the adapter or other attachments are required to connect to the part of the weapon. Come on, come on. That's not an answer. It, silencers shouldn't be restricted. And their response is, uh, with respect to the modular silencers, come on. The department also does not agree with the comment that the final rule should allow for the replacement of a silencer's outer tool by its SOT manufacturer when the original tube is destroyed and replacement is marked with the original serial number. Each qualified manufacturer must register each firearm it manufactures and notify HTF such manufacturer to the effect the to affect the registration. The ATF has taken the position that the replacement of serialized outer tubes now defined as the frame or receiver in such significant manufacturing activity that it results in the magnif manufacture of a new silencer for which it is required. Assholes. So basically, they just doubled down on whatever they said before, and their reason for its existence is the is because it exists circular logic right circular reasoning additionally unlike the return of the nfa firearm conveyed for repair qualified manufacturers are required to pay tax when a new silencer is transferred to an unlicensed person therefore allowing manufacturers to create and return new nfa firearms including silencers without notification to the atf or payment or transfer tax would be contrary to the law so that's stupid. And is you, you really think they care about this? Or do you think that this is in here to cause stress and cause people to read this, jump out and cause problems? This is one of many, many, many slights in this thing. One of many, many, many razor slices. Don't get caught up in their, their manipulation here. Uh, firearms designed and code configured before the effective date of the rule. So this is, we're on page 214 at least. This is firearms designed and configured before the effective date of the rule. <clears throat> Let me stretch for a little bit. Oh, this thing is 364. Why did I think it was 264 and I was almost done? Dang it, it's 364 pages. Holy crap, I'm barely halfway through this thing. All right. Numerous commenters express concern that the grandfathering provision regarding, regarding marking of the comment period is unclear and that they would not know if the new marking requirements would be triggered without more clarity from the ATF. Commenters pointed out that the comment period says licensed manufacturers and importers may continue, may continue to identify the additional firearms other than personally made firearms of the same design and configuration as they existed before the existed date. They stated the use of and in this phrase indicates both criteria must be met for the grandfather. A particular stated that it routinely introduces new S 
new product lines that differ from existing designs and configurations in minor ways. Likewise, others asked if a change in grip panels, barrel length or fixed sight versus adjustable or red dots capable would result in a change of design or clarify configuration. Accordingly, they requested that ATF give clarity to the terms design and configuration, as well as ensure that the current definition of frame or receiver is preserved for grandfathered firearms that will continue to follow the old marketing requirements so as to avoid creating a third category of firearms that do not fit within the, either the old or the new marketing requirements. They also stated that they will face new burdens regarding future firearms designs and configurations without knowing the meaning of those terms. One trade group that represents importers stated that the ATF needs to clarify whether it's grandfathered provision for marking means that all previously manufactured models and configurations are not required to be marked under the new requirements, specifically if the, the group asked if firearms manufactured overseas before the publication of the rule, but imported afterwards, are exempted from the new requirements. If they are not exempt, the group stated that an exemption should be drafted that allows the markings to be engraved on the barrel or slide when the receiver is too small to mark conspicuously. So think Beretta Minx. Not enough room on that little tiny frame for all their stupid requirements. The group argued that simply allowing for this result by variance is inefficient. Another FFL said the rule does not address whether a manufacturer is supposed to mark or register as acquired parts already in its physical inventory. If those parts now meet the new definition of frame or receiver when those parts are used in the assembly of a complete firearm that is a new design or configuration. The FFL also stated that it's unclear what serialization information should be put on the newly defined frame or receiver parts that are vendor supplied but already in its inventory. Alternatively, it said if serialization is not required, then the new rule should address whether a licensee would be required to place unserialized firearms in its AND records with a serial number of no serial number. The FFL pointed out that extraneous imports, impacts of the proposed definition and marking requirements, noting that manufacturers use outside non-licensed vendors to supply numerous firearms components, many of which could fall under the definition of frame or receiver, thus forcing these vendors to become licensees and meet the new marking and recording requirements. Here's the stupid ATF's response to that. The department agrees with the commenters that the grandfathering of firearms should be clar clarified by ensuring that the current definition of frame or receiver is preserved for existing firearms and by clarifying the meaning of design and configuration in the proposed rule. In light of these comments, the final rule recognizes ATF's prior classifications identifying a specific component of a given weapon as the frame or receiver, including variants thereof as falling within the new definition of frame or receiver. Only ATF's prior determinations that a partially complete disassembled or non-functional frame or receiver, including a parts kit, was not or did not include a firearm frame or receiver as defined prior to this rule are excluded from the grandfathering clause. Such determinations, including those in which the ATF had determined that the item or kit had not yet reached the stage of manufacturer or include a frame or receiver under the existing definitions, because this rule expressly regulates weapon and frame or receiver parts kits in aggregations of parts with partially complete frames or receivers that are designed to or may be readily converted to expel a projectile, these prior ATF classifications in which the entire kit may na not have been presented to the ATF at time of clarification will need to be reevaluated re on a case-by-case -case basis. Oh my God. To address confusion concerning the meaning of new design and current configuration, the final rule retains the marking gra grandfathering provision, but revises the text to remove and configuration and designs new and defines new design to mean the designs of the existing frame or receiver has been functionally modified or altered as distinguished from performing a cosmetic process that adds to or changes the decoration of the frame or receiver by adding or replacing stocks, barrels, or accessories to the frame or receiver. The department considers commenters' concerns that the po potential effect on the new rule to require new configurations of existing models to be marked under the new marking requirements would impose substantial costs such as the cost of making new molds to conform with the new requirements on existing product lines that are not otherwise being modified. 
ATF considered these comments in light of the public safety interest, fucking assholes, in ensuing, ensuring appropriate markings because ATF has the capacity to successfully trace the many hundreds of thousands of grandfathered firearms and will be in, what does that mean? ATF has the capacity to successfully trace the many hundreds of thousands of grandfathered firearms and will be able to continue to trace them even if there is a change in configuration? What does that even mean? What are they so confident of right there? The department removed and configuration. The revised provision therefore allows manufacturers to mark the same information on the same component defined as a frame and receiver as they did before the effective date of the rule, which includes a specific component of a weapon or device and variants thereof that ATF classified as the frame or receiver, therefore, I mean, frame or receiver before the rule becomes effective. Oh, my goodness. My mind's turning into mush. I'm understanding this, but it's getting foggy. In regard to the comment and how the rule applies to new designs on of firearms already in the inventory, the final rule makes clear that the new marking requirements apply only to frames or receivers manufactured after the effective date of the final rule. This change will help accommodate, help accommodate, fuck you, help it common ch changes in firearms technology while still ensuring that the firearms frames or receivers with new modular designs are marked and can be traced. The new marking information substantially, substance, substan, oh, substa, substa, substantive, oh, I, can't, I don't know that word substantively whatever differs from the current marking requirements for firearms other than personally made firearms only in that the licensee's name city and state are alternatively the licensee's name or recognize abbreviation or the manufacturer's importer abbreviated ffl number must be placed on the frame or receiver in addition to the unique identification number and cannot be placed on the side of the barrel Assholes. The reason for requiring all this information to be placed on the frame or receiver is that the associated licensee information when marked on the side of the barrel as currently allowed, can be separated from the serialized frame or receiver in limited circumstances, rendering the firearm untraceable. <gasps> the unique identification number or traditional serial number on the frame or receiver alone may not be sufficient because the ATF may not know which licensee produced the firearm or the location where the traceable records are located. <gasps> Can you imagine if uh, somebody had a, a Beretta Minx with, without a barrel on it and what the ATF would do? <gasps> Oh my goodness, because those are constantly used in crimes. Barrelless minxes are responsible for most crime. So I'm super glad that the ATF came up with 360 something pages to help us battle barrelless minxes. This is difficult. This is difficult. Just keep fighting. Just don't even think about it. Jump in some alcohol, get wake up and keep fighting. Uh, manufacturers may, however, seek a marking variance from the director if they find it difficult to transition to these marking requirements for new frame or receiver designs. Oh, isn't that nice? So here's a bunch of crap, but oh yeah, if you've already been doing it, you don't have to worry about it because you can just get a variance. Now, maybe they won't give them the variances, but that's, I'm going to put that in my notes. I've only got three notes, so waste of three hours here today. All right, voluntary classifications of firearms and armor-piercing ammunition. So if you weren't already punching a refrigerator, we're about to talk about armor-piercing ammunition. So they definitely wanted to accomplish something here. This is probably Obama's like wet fantasy of what he wishes he could have done, but he didn't have the ability or the gumption or the balls to do it. It wasn't politically feasible to do this in 15. Or maybe they really should have done this in 15 because they would have had a better chance. So uh, this is this is crazy to listen to this part. All right, a few commenters said that the way is drafted does not oblig obligate ATF to respond to a classification request, which could allow the agency to ignore a classification request, install advancement of new products or techni technologies deemed politically undesirable. Commenters also noted there is no requirement that the agency notify the submitter that the agency has accepted or rejected a classification request. Therefore, the commenters advocated that there should be a requirement that determinations be rendered within three months or that some other reasonable time frame be added to the proposal. One commenter suggested adding language to deeming 
the submitted project compliant as proposed by the requester if ATF or fails to respond within a specified time. It also recommended deleting for purposes of flexibility the prohibition on rendering a determination unless a firearm accessory attachment is installed on the firearm for which it is designed to be intended to be used. Further, it proposed adding a sentence stating that an ATF determination is an opinion and does not have the force of law. Other commenter com claimed that the codification of the classification letter process fails to abide by the Attorney General's memorandum entitled Prohibition on Improper Guidance Documents. Commenters also said it's unrealistic to believe that a manufacturer would have the ability to submit marking or instruction materials with the classification request per the proposed rule, as often sometimes these materials are developed just before a product launches. They also questioned whether a prior determination becomes invalid if instructions or marking materials change, thereby, therefore, thereby triggering submission of another request and reverting the process to the proposed rule's default marketing requirements, make marking requirements pending a new determination. Other commenters argued that asking manufacturers to submit instructions and manuals is not only a huge administrative burden, but also lead to less productive and fewer submissions of instructions as it seemed possible that ATF could use the guides against the manufacturers. The lengthy waits and delays that manufacturers already face under the current process, according to the commenter, would only be compounded under the new rules. All this would have the unintended consequence of creating a dis disincentive for manufacturers to develop new, safer, and more reliable firearms because of heavy regulatory burden. Oh, really? Is that an unintended consequence? Really? Is that an unintended consequence? Really? So uh, let me make that in my notes. So we'll put that over there. Some commenters furly further opined that the ATF's classification. Let me put this in here so y'all can stew on that juice. Some commenters further opine that ATF's classification process allows the agency to play favorites, pick technologies, and influence court decisions without going through the APA. They asserted that the proposed rule actually incentivizes technical developments that will create even worse black market of untraceable firearms. One commenter suggested that the last sentence of proposed rule to state that the ATF classifications of frames of receivers issued after the publication of the final rule are not considered authoritative with regard to other samples, designs, models, or configurations of frames of receivers. Adding this language, the commenter said, would allow a licensee to leverage a previous hardware determination and make it more transparent to the industry that a previous hardware determination is acceptable practice if the design is in existence prior to the publication of the date of the final rule. Here's the stupid ATF's response to all that. The department agrees with the commenters that the rule as proposed would have resulted in voluntarily classification in more voluntary classification requests to the ATF to determine which part of a new design of a firearm was the receiver. This would have increased the burden on both the licensees and the ATF. The department agrees with the commenters that the statute is best read to focus on a single portion of the weapon as the frame or receiver. Oh my God. Accordingly, the department establishes a new definition of frame or receiver as described to focus on a single portion of a weapon for frames and handguns, receivers for rifles, shotguns, projectile weapons, other than the handguns, and frames for receivers from silencers. Don't drink every time you hear that. Get pissed. Every time you hear that Tetris block dropped, get pissed. Somebody's getting paid good money. They're getting a government retirement to drop this steaming pile of crap on the rights of your children. Get pissed. Every time you hear that, get pissed and get motivated to do something. Because that bullshit Tetris block I've had to read so many times is garbage. This entire thing rests on like four little tiny little precarious little ankles and if we can get our shit together and knock those ankles out we'll never see gun control shit again this is the end of gun control get pissed but realize this is the end of gun control right here this is nothing this was a whole bunch of razor cuts that are going to amount to pissing off the ladies that are changing the paradigm pissing off the organizations that are about to take over for the NRA. And guess what? It isn't the Gun Owners of America. It sure as hell isn't the Second Amendment Foundation. It ain't FPC. They're going to help, but they're going to watch as other organizations take over. Anyhow, I'll try to read this without comment. I'm not really commenting as much as just taking a break from reading this because it drives me insane and my eyes hurt. <clears throat> All right, so where was that? The final rule does not adopt... The proposed definition supplement entitled, this is just the rest of that stupid Tetris thing. I'm going to punch my refrigerator every time I read that. 
With regard to other types of firearms classification requests, ATF has long accepted voluntary requests in furtherance of its mission to assist persons in complying with the requirements of the Gun Control Act and NFA as a public service. Isn't that nice of them? They're not even getting paid for it. They just love safety so much that they they assist the, uh, those of us that want to comply. There is no statutory requirement for a person to submit such requests and likewise no requirement for ATF to act upon such requests. Alternatively, anyone may seek private counsel to determine a person's legal obligations under the firearms laws and regulations. The department disagrees with the suggestion to eliminate for flexibility the provision that states that directors shall not issue a determination regarding a firearm which may be sold or distributed with an accessory attachment unless it is installed on the firearm in the configuration for which it is the design intended to be used. Firearm classification can be made under the Stupid Gun Control Act or the Stupid NFA. The department disagrees with the suggestion to add a sentence to individual ATF firearms classification saying that the classification is an opinion which does not have the force of law. Firearms classifications are private letter rulers, rulings issued to a particular requester with respect to a specific firearm, firearm <clears throat> item. Saying that ATF classification letters do not have the force of law may mislead the requester into believing that the statutes and regulations referenced therein or possible administrative actions taken by the ATF are not required to be followed. The Gun Control Act and the NFA and their implementing re regulations clearly have the force of law, effect of law. Should a requester ignore the classification letter and move forward to produce or sell import items classified as firearms in violation of the Gun Control Act or NFA, the classification letter could be used to prove the willfulness of the violation in a criminal prosecution, administrative, licensing, or tax collecting proceeding, or for seizure and forfeiture of unlawfully produced or possessed weapons. The department also disagrees with the comment that codification, uh, codification of the classification letter process fails to abide by the memorandum of the Attorney General entitled Pro Prohibition on Improper Guidance Documents, not only because classification letters are not guidance documents, but also because the memorandum was rescinded by the Attorney General dated July 1, 2021. Oh, isn't that nice? Consistent with the President's executive order entitled Revocation of Certain Executive Orders Concerning Federal Regulations. So last year, the President removed that check. So, okay, they can do what they want again. The department agrees with the comment that it may be burdensome for requesters to, to submit instructions, guides, and marketing materials with the classification request if those materials are not made available at the time of submission. However, as explained in the rules, these items and materials are important for the ATF to determine whether an unfinished, disassembled, or non-functional item or kit is a firearm subject to regulation or law. When sold or distributed with a partially complete, disassembled, or non-functional item or kit, they must be submitted. The final rule mitigates this burden by excluding from the requirement this sub requirement submission of such items and materials with firearm samples that are complete and assembled. The department also agrees with the comment at, that the requester of a voluntary classification of a specific component as a frame or receiver should be able to rely on that classification for other models and configurations the requester manufactures. For this reason, the final rule makes clear that determinations made by the director identifying a specific component of a weapon as the frame or receiver are defined, wait, as defined, are applicable to various thereof, variants thereof, and ATF classification of specific component and the frame or receiver is applicable to or authoritative with respect to other sample design model or configuration of the same weapon so that the requester does not need to submit additional requests for, for future variants. In addition, defining the term frame or receiver in a more limited manner in the final rule will reduce the or eliminate the need for industry members to voluntarily request a classification from ATF when deciding whether a particular component of a weapon is the frame or receiver, thereby reducing manufacturing costs, whatever that means, stupid. So, holy moly, where are we at? 224. Uh, next up is concerns with record keeping requirements, acquisition and disposition records. 
Several FFL stated they would have problems with record keeping and inventory if there is more than one frame or receiver. They claim that paperwork and tracking would be very burdensome because part swapping and replacements would result in multiple in inventory entries. Likewise, many inventory members asserted that serialization of multiple frames or receiver parts would create record keeping havoc. One commenter offered a hypothetical assume the ATF determines that a receiver has three separate parts, each of which must be serialized and assemble. Assume all the parts are made by the same manufacturer. If part A is made on March 1, receiver part B is made on September 5th, and receiver part C is made on December 8th, the commenter was unsure which date would be the date of manufacture if recorded in a single entry. Or if the dates were recorded in separate lines, the commenter stated this would be alarming because there would be a duplicate serial number recorded for one firearm. Finally, the commenter asked, when all three parts were finally assembled to make a full receiver, would that action require another record? And if so, what would be the date of that manufacture? Additionally, FFLs asserted it would be impossible to comply with the marking requirements because there is no compatible, compatible software to use for record keeping and inventory. A major manufacturer stated it's then current electronic business suite, which is responsible for tracking all parts in product inventory and for generating the AMD records, is inherently incompatible with multiple serial numbers per firearm, whether matching or non-matching. It's further stated that it was not aware of a viable solution ad available to adopt this system in a way that would allow for tracking of multiple serial numbers per serialized item. This sentiment was echoed by several companies that highlighted the logistical problems with trying to keep track of multiple serial numbers on numerous frames of receivers. Another major manufacturer stated it would take years to test and change its already highly customized software suite to comply with the rulemaking. Its systems said are not equipped to process manufacturer firearms with more than one serialized component to serialize and track more than one component with the same serial number to associate more than one serial number with a complete firearm uh, the company acquires and to generate the AMD records or to update a serial number to reflect marking of a personally made firearm. The company stated it would not comply with the could not comply with the proposed rule and explained how trying to comply would be costly and disruptive to its manufacturing lines. These types of cost estimates provided by various companies are described below. Manufacturers also pointed out an inconsistency between the proposed change to code, which would require manufacturers to record the serial number and other required information no later than close of the next business day following the date of manufacture or other acquisition which would require manufacturers to identify a complete weapon no later than seven days following the date of the completion of the active manufacturing process or to disposition or whichever is sooner. They asked how they can record the serial number and other information on a manufactured firearm by close of the next business day if it's not required to be identified for seven days from the completion of its manufacturer. Other industry members raised concerns about recording and re, 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 uh, I don't know what that is. Reconciling frames or receivers that could be manufactured or required or acquired prior to the time period in which the required markings must be applied. These types of firearms, for example, fully machined on serialized frames, could be numerous, and it appeared to commenters that ATF expected manufacturers to list these firearms that have no identifying information with an NSN serial number. This, according to commenters, would create difficulties because the manufacturers would have to keep track of unserialized parts in the A and D records. And if if any of those firearms were destroyed prior to serialization, the manufacturer would have no way to identify which frame or receiver corresponded to each recorded NSN entry in their books. Commenters worried that this would result in countless record keeping errors and theft loss reporting of unserialized parts would be exceedingly difficult, if not impossible. One suggested that a clear statement be added in the final rule that Frames of receivers need not be acquired by manufacturers. Uh, receivers need not be acquired by manufacturers prior to marking if the parts being used in the manufacturing process could address this concern. Similarly, commenters stated that the code which provides manufacturers seven, day following, seven days following the date of the completion of the firearm or frame be shipped or disposed of separately to both mark and record the identifying information in its records should be retained. Several manufacturers contended that the commercial record exception in the proposed code, which would exempt manufacturers from recording the manufacturer or acquisition of a firearm no later than the close of next business day, 
So as long as they held a commercial record with relevant information, it's irrelevant and would never apply. They argued that a commercial record is a record of transaction between a transferor and a transferee and that the internal manufacturer records are not commercial records. Therefore, they argued the exemption from the next day recording requirement and allowance of up to seven days would never apply. They made similar arguments that the commercial record exception would also not apply for a repair or replacement request, thus making it impossible to comply with the next business day rule. Accordingly, they requested the current seven day deadline be retained. Because the, this is the stupid ATS response to all that. <clears throat> because the department agrees with the commenters that the definition of firearms is best read to you know, a single part of a weapon as being the frame or receiver, the, oh my God, the final rule adopts three subsets of the proposed definitions, frame or receiver. Frame for handguns variants, there are shotguns, projectile weapons, other than handguns of variants, there are been frame for receivers of a suppressor. Assholes. The more limited definitions adopted in this final rule should address the costs and software problems that commenters raised. The department also agrees with commenters who pointed out the inconsistency between marking and record keeping requirements for manufacturers. The department agrees that the time period should be the same and has clarified that markings be placed and firearms be recorded no longer than seventh day following the date of manufacturer or other acquisition of non-NFA firearms, frames, receivers, or such weapons. Likewise, to be consistent with the record keeping and the ATF's Form 2 submission requests requirements, the NFA firearm weapons and parts defined as firearms must be marked and recorded in Form 2 submitted no longer than the close of the next business day after manufacture. The department also agrees that the commercial record provision is not applicable to most manufacturers and that providing the seven-day grace period to both mark and record makes the commercial record allowance for NFA that are manufactured unnecessarily. What does that mean? Allowance for non-NFA weapons that are manufactured unnecessarily. For those reasons, that provision has been amended in the final rule to apply only to NFA weapons that are otherwise acquired commercially. Next one is record keeping for privately made firearms. <clears throat> one manufacturer stated it did not understand how FFLs are to record personally made guns that are marked in accordance with state laws such as Connecticut, which have different requirements for assignment and structure of a serial number. Under the final rule, the licensee marking the frame or receiver of a kit gun must place the licensee's abbreviated license number, that RDS key, as a prefix before the unique identification number originally placed on the marker of the personally made gun that would be adopted by the licensee. The adopted markings must be otherwise must otherwise meet the re marking requirements. The requirement allows ATF to trace the firearm to a particular licensee. If the state has issued a unique number that must be placed on the firearm, then the licensee abbreviated FFL number would be added as a prefix to that number if the licensee is going to accept that firearm into inventory. Oh, well, that's funny. So now they're making a little train of extra serial numbers on your gun for some states. Sorry, Connecticut. Again, nothing in this rule requires the licensee to accept a personally made it gun into their inventory or to mark them on behalf of the unlicensed people. So you don't have to even take these guns, gunsmiths. You could just leave these people hanging. I don't know if I could keep going. I'm getting bored. The retention, record retention burden. Generally, commenters oppose that the requirement that FFLs retain their records indefinitely. This might be the end. I don't know until they discontinue their business, arguing that doing so would be burdensome and costly. Some pointed to the cost and burden on gunsmiths if many of them had to become licensees in order to mark personally made firearms. The gunsmiths would then be subject to all the record keeping requirements imposed on the FFLs. Other commenters also expressed concern that having an FFL retain their records indefinitely would raise privacy concerns and subject FFLs to potential liability. The FFLs agreed, oh, the FFLs argued FFLs, they would access ATF Form 4473s and use them to target unsuspecting firearms owners and steal their firearms. Here's the stupid ATF's answer to all that. The, eight, the department disagrees that the record retention rule is unreasonably burdensome, raises additional privacy, raises additional privacy concerns, or increases the probability of break-ins, or exasperates the dull deleterious, oh my God, the del deleterious effects of break-ins that do occur. Oh my goodness. 
At present, licensees are required to maintain their records of acquisition and disposition for at least 20 years. The attorney general in this rule is exercising his authority, because they don't care about their sexist, under and to extend the 20-year retention period for licensees so that their records are not destroyed. This rule allows closed out paper records that are more than 20 years old to be stored in a separate warehouse, which would be considered part of the business or collection premises for the purpose of this and would be subject to inspection accordance with. Alternatively, these paper records may be turned into the ATF if the licensee voluntarily chooses to discontinue its business or license activity for which the records were maintained, even if subsequently obtains a new license. So let's remember that when a gun shop moves from one store to another store, one building to another building, it has to get a new license. And when it does that, it defaults all its records to the ATF. Whenever it shuts its license down and moves to the other one, all those records went to the ATF. So every time you've seen a gun shop move, all their records went to the ATF during that move. Uh, with regard to persons who may become engaged in the business as gunsmiths so they can mark firearms, such persons have always been required by law to be licensed and maintain records of firearms they take into inventory for gunsmithing work, including engraving firearms. This rule clarifies that licensed gunsmiths do not need to be relicensed as manufacturers for the sole purpose of engraving or otherwise marking personally made guns. Additionally, in response to comments that the final rule or the final rule reduces costs by clarifying that licensees may have firearms engraved on the spot by any person under the direct supervision of the licensee without the engraver taking the firearm into inventory, providing the marking meets all rec uh, requirements. So how's that for messed up? They assume a lot here, and I'm trying not to comment, but that's tough. All right, this will definitely be the last one. I'm dying. Record retention impact on public safety. Oh, my goodness. This is going to help a lot. Some commenters argued that requiring FFLs to maintain their records indefinitely instead of the 20-year time period serves no purpose. They asked ATF to produce evidence that there's a statistically significant number of instances where a crime involved a firearm purchase outside the 20-year window to justify the change. Further, they doubted the Form 4473s from over 20 years ago would be helpful in solving crimes. Other commenters stated that sales records rarely help solve cases and claim that tracing has been not known not to work. Many challenge the usefulness in changing the retention of records requirements, stating that the average time to crime for recovered firearms is less than 10 years, and the ATF and other entities have previously said that a firearm is untraceable after five years. At least one commenter opined that the retention period should be shortened to seven years. Here's the stupid ATF's lazy response to all that. The department disagrees with the commenters who said that the record retention requirement serves no purpose. Firearms are generally durable weapons that last many decades and their lethality and potential use in crime does not diminish over time. As explained in this rule, firearms have been traced to retailers who destroyed numerous records that were older than 20 years, but those traces could not successfully be created. Uh, the National Tracing Center conducted an analysis, excuse me, an analysis of all trace requests submitted by January 2010 and whatever that were closed under a particular code in the tracing system indicating the FFL specifically informed APF that it did not have records for that firearms because the records were more than 20 years old and had been destroyed. At least six average per year. <gasps> it's almost 100 per month that are over 20 years old. Could not be completed during this time period because the records had been destroyed. Of these total unsuccessful traces, approximately 182 of the traces were designated as urgent <gasps> and 1,000 were related to a homicide or an attempted homicide <gasps> and 4,000 were related to violent crime. So that gives an indication that if they're going to count 1,000 as not including suicide and then they're going to count 4,000 as violent crime, that can only indicate that they're counting three out of every four violent crimes as suicide. Or they're counting suicide as three out of four violent crimes. How heinous is that? It's right there in the stupid thing. They just wrote it differently. But that's saying that they don't even, whenever they're going to use suicide when they need to exploit it and ignore it when they feel like it. Further, within it, obviously, the 
point there is that suicide isn't solved by taking away the implement. Suicide is solved by taking away the motivation. Further, the advancement of electronic scanning and storage technology, maintaining old records, is not as difficult or costly as it was when ATF first allowed records over 20 years to be destroyed in its 1985 rulemaking. So when the ATF first allowed in its rulemaking, how about FU and FU and FU? I'm done with this. So that was 232 pages. I can't handle it. I can only take so much stress in my life. I want to thank the two super chats. I don't know how much money you made today, but I made, I get past all this crap. That's how many bullshit craps we had in here. 20 bucks and 40 bucks, 60 bucks today. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'll continue to read this if I can, but holy moly, is this horrible. <clears throat> uh, thanks again to our patrons that made it possible for me to even take the time to do this. Thanks again to Mark and to... Uh, Garrett for throwing a couple extra bucks at me to make it not worth the while, but at least, you know. Pay for some uh, food or something. You're not like metal. So if you want to break, go sit down. If you're not willing to break or bend, then it's time to metal up. That's what I'd encourage you to do. And uh, thanks for watching. Hey, did you know that you could help support our future projects and let everyone know you're a fan of what we do? Check out our print-on-demand store. We have a tab here on YouTube. When you click on it, you can choose from a bunch of different items. We have shirts and posters and coffee mugs. Click on the one you like. When you find the design you want to put on it, choose a color and a size if it's appropriate. And when you purchase these items, a portion goes to help fund our future projects. We really do appreciate your support. You get some cool stuff. When you get that stuff, post pictures here and on other platforms, and we'll hook you up next time you order from our gear website store. Thank you for your support of gunwebsites.com. So let us know what you think. We'll be watching the comments wherever you find the video over on GunStreamer.com or on GunTube.org. Thank you for supporting our projects. If you'd like to buy us a cup of coffee, check out our Patreon channel. The guys and gals of GunWebsites.com encourages you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thank you for watching GunWebsites.com.